Section Zero of The Battle of the Books. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Introduction Jonathan Swift was born in 1667 on the 30th of November. His father was a Jonathan Swift, sixth of the ten sons of Reverend Thomas Swift, vicar of Goodrich, near Ross in Herefordshire, who had married Elizabeth Dryden, niece to the poet Dryden's grandfather. Jonathan Swift married at Leicester Abigail Eric, or Herrick, who was of the family that had given to England Robert Herrick, the poet. As their eldest brother, Godwin, was prospering in Ireland, four other Swifts, Dryden, William, Jonathan, and Adam, all in turn found their way to Dublin. Jonathan was admitted an attorney of the King's Inns, Dublin, and was appointed by the benchers to the office of steward of the King's Inns, in January 1666. He died in April 1667, leaving his widow with an infant daughter, Jane, an unborn child. Swift was born in Dublin seven months after his father's death. His mother, after a time, returned to her own family in Leicester, and the child was added to the household of his uncle, Godwin Swift, who, by his four wives, became father to ten sons of his own and four daughters. Godwin Swift sent his nephew to Kilkenny School, where he had William Congreve among his schoolfellows. In April 1782, Swift had entered at Trinity College as pensioner, together with his cousin Thomas, son of his uncle Thomas. That cousin Thomas afterwards became rector of Puttenham in Surrey. Jonathan Swift graduated as B.A. at Dublin in February 1686 and remained in Trinity College for another three years. He was ready to proceed to M.A. when his uncle Godwin became insane. The troubles of 1689 also caused the closing of the university, and Jonathan Swift went to Leicester, where mother and son took to counsel together as to future possibilities of life. The retired statesman, Sir William Temple, at Moor Park near Farnham in Surrey, was in highest esteem with the new king and the leaders of the revolution. His father, as master of the Irish rolls, had been a friend of Godwin Swift's, and with his wife, Swift's mother, could claim cousinship. After some months, therefore, at Leicester, Jonathan Swift, aged twenty-two, went to Moor Park, and entered Sir William Temple's household, doing service with the expectation of advancement through his influence. The advancement he desired was in the church. When Swift went to Moor Park, he found in its household a child six or seven years old, daughter to Mrs. Johnson, who was trusted servant and companion to Lady Gifford, Sir William Temple's sister. With this little Esther, aged seven, Swift, aged twenty-two, became a playfellow and helper in her studies. He broke his English for her into what he called their little language, that was part of the same playful kindliness, and passed into their afterlife. In July 1692, with Sir William Temple's help, Jonathan Swift commenced M.A. in Oxford as of Hart Hall. In 1694, Swift's ambition, having been thwarted by an offer of a clerkship of one hundred and twenty pounds a year in the Irish rolls, he broke from Sir William Temple, took orders, and obtained, through other influence, in January 1695, the small prebendary of Kilroot in the north of Ireland. 
he was there for about a year close by in belfast was an old college friend named waring who had a sister swift was captivated by miss waring called her verena and would have become engaged to marry her if she had not flinched from engagement with a young clergyman whose income was but a hundred a year but sir william temple had missed jonathan swift from moor park differences were forgotten and swift at his wish went back this was in sixteen ninety six when his little pupil esther johnson was fifteen swift said of her i knew her from six years old and had some share in her education by directing what books she could read and perpetually instructing her in the principles of honour and virtue from which she never swerved in any one action or moment of her life she was sickly from her childhood until about the age of fifteen but then grew into perfect health and was then looked upon as one of the most beautiful graceful and agreeable young women in london only a little too fat her hair was blacker than a raven and every feature of her face in perfection this was the stella of swift's afterlife the one woman to whom his love was given but side by side with the slow growth of his knowledge of all she was for him was the slow growth of his conviction that a text of giddiness and deafness which first came when he was twenty and recurred at times throughout his life were signs to be associated with that which he regarded as the curse upon his life his end would be like his uncle godwin's it was a curse transmittable to children but if he desired to keep the influence his genius gave him he could not tell the world why he refused to marry only to stella who remained unmarried for his sake and gave her life to him could all be known returned to moor park swift wrote in sixteen ninety seven the battle of the books as well as the tale of the tub with which it was published seven years afterwards in seventeen o four perrault and others had been battling in france over the relative merits of ancient and modern writers the debate had spread to england on behalf of the ancients stress was laid by temple on the letters of phalaris tyrant of Agrigentum. Watton replied to Sir William for the moderns. The Honorable Charles Boyle of Christ Church published a new edition of the Epistles of Phalaris, with translation of the Greek text into Latin. Dr. Bentley, the King's librarian, published a dissertation on the Epistles of Phalaris denying their value and arguing that phalaris did not write them christ church replied through charles boyle with dr bentley's dissertation on the epistles of phalaris examined swift entered into the war with a light heart and matched the ancients in defending them for the amusement of his patron his incidental argument between the spider and the bee has provided a catchphrase sweetness and light to a combatant of latter times sir william temple died on the twenty seventh of january sixteen ninety nine swift then became the chaplain to lord berkeley in dublin castle and it was as a little surprise to lady berkeley who liked him to read to her robert boyle's meditations that swift wrote the meditation on a broomstick in february seventeen hundred he obtained from lord berkeley the vicarage of lorachor with the living of rathbegin also in the diocese of meath in the beginning of seventeen o one esther johnson to whom sir william temple had bequeathed a leasehold farm in wicklow came with an elder friend miss dingley and settled in laracor to be near swift during one of the visits to london made from laracor 
swift attacked the false pretensions of astrologers by that predicted of the death of mr patridge a prophetic almanac maker of which he described the accomplishment so clearly that partridge had much ado to get credit for being alive the lines addressed to stella speak for themselves Candenus and vanessa was meant as polite and courteous admonition to miss hester van homry a young lady in whom green sickness seems to have produced devotion to swift and forms that embarrassed him and with which he did not well know how to deal h m the bookseller to the reader this discourse as it is unquestionably of the same author so it seems to have been written about the same time with the tale of a tub i mean the year sixteen ninety seven when the famous dispute was on foot about ancient and modern learning the controversy took its rise from an essay of sir william temple's upon that subject which was answered by w wotton b d with an appendix by dr bentley endeavouring to destroy the credit of aesop and phalaris for authors whom sir william temple had in the essay before mentioned highly commended in that appendix the doctor falls hard upon a new edition of phalaris put out by the hon charles boyle now earl of ory to which mr boyle replied at large with great learning and wit and the doctor voluminously rejoined in this dispute the town highly resented to see a person of sir william temple's character and merits roughly used by the two reverend gentlemen aforesaid and without any manner of provocation at length there appearing no end of the quarrel our author tells us that the books in st james's library looking upon themselves as parties principally concerned took up the controversy and came to a decisive battle but the manuscript by the injury of fortune or weather being in several places imperfect we cannot learn to which side the victory fell i must warn the reader to beware of applying to persons what is here meant only of books in the most literal sense so when virgil is mentioned we are not to understand the person of a famous poet called by that name but only certain sheets of paper bound up in leather containing in print the work of the said poet and so of the rest the preface of the author satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own which is the chief reason for that kind reception it meets within the world and that so very few are offended with it but if it should happen otherwise the danger is not great and i have learned from long experience never to apprehend mischief from those understandings i have been able to provoke for anger and fury though they add strength to the sinews of the body yet are found to relax those of the mind and to render all its efforts feeble and impotent there is a brain that will endure but one scumming let the owner gather it with discretion and manage his little stock with husbandry but of all things let him be aware of bringing it under the lash of his betters because that will make it all bubble up into impertinence and will find no new supply wit without knowledge being a sort of cream which gathers in a night to the top and by a skilful hand may be soon whipped into froth but when scummed away what appears underneath will be fit for nothing but to be thrown to the hogs End of section zero read by elijah fisher section one of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift section one 
a full and true account of the battle fought last friday between the ancient and the modern books in st james library whoever examines with due circumspection into the annual records of time will find it remarked that war is the child of pride and pride the daughter of riches the former of which assertions may soon be granted but one cannot so easily subscribe to the latter for pride is nearly related to beggary and want either by father or mother and sometimes by both and to speak naturally it very seldom happens among men to fall out when all have enough invasions usually travelling from north to south that is to say from poverty to plenty the most ancient and natural grounds of quarrels are lust and avarice which though we may allow to be brethren or collateral branches of pride are certainly the issues of want for to speak in the phrase of writers upon politics we may observe in the republic of dogs which in its original seems to be an institution of the many that the whole state is ever in the profoundest peace after a full meal and that civil broils arise among them when it happens for one great bone to be seized on by some leading dog who either divides it among the few and then it falls to an oligarchy or keeps to it to himself and then it runs up to a tyranny the same reasoning also holds place among them in those dissensions we behold upon a turgescency in any of their females for the right of possession lying in common it being impossible to establish a property in so delicate a case jealousies and suspicions do so abound that the whole commonwealth of that street is reduced to a manifest state of war of every citizen against every citizen till some one of more courage conduct or fortune than the rest seizes and enjoys the pride upon which naturally arises plenty of heart-burning and envy and snarling against the happy dog again if we look upon any of these republics engaged in a foreign war either of invasion or defence we shall find the same reasoning will serve as to the grounds and occasions of each and that poverty or want in some degree or other whether real or in opinion which makes no alteration in the case has a great share as well as pride on the part of the aggressor now whoever will please to take this scheme and either reduce or adapt to an intellectual state or commonwealth of learning will soon discover the first ground of disagreement between the two great parties at this time in arms and may form just conclusions upon the merits of either chaos but the issue or events of this war are not so easy to conjecture at for the present quarrel is so inflamed by the warm heads of either faction and the pretensions somewhere or other so exorbitant as not to admit the least overtures of accommodation this quarrel first began as i have heard it affirmed by an old dweller in the neighbourhood about a small spot of ground lying and being upon one of the two tops of the hill parnassus the highest and largest of which had it seems been time out of mind in quiet possession of certain tenants called the ancients and the others was held by the moderns but these disliking their present station sent certain ambassadors to the ancients complaining of a great nuisance how the height of that part of parnassus quite spoiled the prospect of theirs especially towards the east and therefore to avoid a war offered them the choice of this alternative either that the ancients would please to remove themselves and their affections down to the lower summit which the moderns would graciously surrender to them and advance into their place or else the said ancients will give leave to the moderns to come with shovels and mattocks and level the said hill as low as they shall think it convenient to which the ancients made answer how little they expected such a message as this from a colony whom they had admitted out of their own free grace to so near a neighbourhood that as to their own seat they were abhorrences of it and therefore to talk of them of a removal or surrender was a language they did not understand 
that if the height of the hill on their side shortened the prospect of the moderns it was a disadvantage they could not help but desired them to consider whether that injury if it be any were not largely recompensed by the shade and shelter it afforded them that as to the levelling or digging down it was either folly or ignorance to propose it if they did or did not know that side of the hill was an entire rock which would break their tools and hearts without any damage to itself that they would therefore advise the moderns rather to raise their own side of the hill than dream of pulling down that of the ancients to the former of which they would not only give license but also largely contribute all this was rejected by the moderns with much indignation who still insisted upon one of the two expedients and so this difference broke out into a long and obstinate war maintained on the one part by resolution and by the courage of certain leaders and alleys but on the other by the greatness of their number upon all defeats according continual recruits in this quarrel whole rivulets of ink have been exhausted and the virulence of both parties enormously augmented now it must be here understood that ink is the great missive weapon in all battles of the learned which conveyed through a sort of engine called a quill infinite numbers of these are darted at the enemy by the valiant on each side with equal skill and violence as if it were an engagement of porcupines this malignant liquor was compounded by the engineer who invented it of two ingredients which are gall and copperas by its bitterness and venom to suit in some degree as well as to foment the genius of the combatants and as the grecians after an engagement when they could not agree about the victory were one to set up trophies on both sides the beaten party being content to be at the same expense to keep itself in countenance a laudable and ancient custom happily revived of late in the art of war so the learned after a sharp and bloody dispute do on both sides hang out their trophies too whichever comes by the worst these trophies have largely inscribed on them the merits of the cause a full impartial account of such a battle and how the victory fell clearly to the party that set them up they are known to the world under several names as disputes arguments rejoinders brief considerations answers replies remarks reflections objections confutations for a very few days they are fixed up all in public places either by themselves or their representatives for passengers to gaze at whence the chiefest and largest are removed to certain magazines they call libraries there to remain in a quarter purposely assigned to them and thenceforth begin to be called books of controversy in these books is wonderfully instilled and preserved the spirit of each warrior while he is alive and after his death his soul transmigrates thither to inform them this at least is the more common opinion but i believe it is with libraries as well as other cemeteries this at least is the more common opinion but i believe it is with libraries as with other cemeteries where some philosophers affirm that a certain spirit which they call brutum hominis hovers over the monument till the body is corrupted and turns to dust or to worms but then vanishes or dissolves so we may say a restless spirit haunts out over every book till dust or worms have seized upon it which to some may happen in a few days but to others later and therefore books of controversy being of all others haunted by the most disorderly spirits have always been confined in a separate lodge from the rest and for fear of a mutual violence against each other it was thought prudent by our ancestors to bind them to the peace with strong iron change of which invention the original occasion was this 
when the works of scrotus first came out they were carried to a certain library and had lodgings appointed them but this author was no sooner settled than he went to visit his master aristotle and there both concerted together to seize plato by main force and turn him out from his ancient station among the divines where he had peaceably dwelt near eight hundred years the attempt succeeded and the two usurpers have reigned over since in his stead but to maintain quiet for the future it was decreed that all polemics of the larger size should be hold fast with a chain by this expedient the public peace of libraries might certainly have been preserved if a new species of controversial books had not arisen of late years instinct with a more malignant spirit from the war above mentioned between the learned about the higher summit of parnassus when these books were first admitted into the public libraries i remember to have said upon occasion to several persons concerned how i was sure they would create broils whether they came unless a world of care were taken and therefore advised that the champions of each side should be coupled together or otherwise mixed that like the blending of contrary poisons their malignity might be employed among themselves and it seems i was neither an ill prophet nor an ill counsellor for it was nothing else but the neglect of this caution which gave occasion to the terrible fight that happened on friday last between the ancient and modern books in the king's library now because the talk of this battle is so fresh in everybody's mouth and the expectation of the town so great to be informed in the particulars i being possessed of all qualifications requisite in an historian and retained by neither party have resolved to comply with the urgent importunity of my friends by writing down a full impartial account thereof the guardian of the regal library a person of great valour but chiefly renowned for his humanity had been a fierce champion for the moderns and in an engagement upon parnassus had vowed with his own hands to knock down two of the ancient chiefs who guarded a small pass on the superior rock but endeavouring to climb up was cruelly obstructed by his own unhappy weight and tendency towards his censure a quality to which those of the modern party are extremely subject for being light-headed they have in speculation a wonderful agility and conceive nothing too high for them to mount but in reducing to practice discover a mighty pressure about their postures and their heels having thus failed in his design the disappointed champion bore a cruel rancour to the ancients which he resolved to gratify by showing all marks of his favour uh, to the books of their adversaries and lodging them in the fairest apartments when at the same time whatever book had the boldness to own itself for an advocate of the ancients was buried alive in some obscure corner and threatened upon the least displeasure to be turned out of doors besides if it so happened that about this time there was a strange confusion of place among all the books in the library for which several reasons were assigned some imputed it to a great heap of learned dust which a perverse wind blew off from a shelf of moderns into the keeper's eyes others affirmed he had a humour to pick the worms out of the schoolmen and swallow them fresh and fasting whereof some fell upon his spleen and some climbed up into his head to the great perturbation of both and lastly others maintained that by walking much in the dark about the library he had quite lost the situation of it out of his mind and therefore when replacing his books he was apt to mistake and clap descartes next to aristotle for plato had got between hobbes and the seven wise masters and virgil was hemmed in with dryden on one side and wither on the other meanwhile those books that were advocates for the moderns chose out one from among them to make a progress through the whole library examine the number and strength of their party 
and concert their affairs this messenger performed all things very industriously and brought back with him a list of their forces in all fifty thousand consisting chiefly of light horse heavy armed foot and mercenaries whereof the foot were in general but sorely armed and worse clad their horses large but extremely out of case in heart however some few by trading among the ancients had furnished themselves tolerably enough while things were in this ferment discord grew extremely high hot words passed on both sides and ill blood was plentifully bred here a solitary ancient squeezed up among a whole shelf of moderns offered fairly to dispute the case and to prove by manifest reason that the priority was due to them from long possession and in regard of their prudence antiquity and above all their great merits towards the modern but these denied the premises and seemed very much to wonder how the ancients could pretend to insist upon their antiquity when it was so plain if they went to that that the moderns were much more ancient of the two as for any obligations they owed to the ancients they renounced them all it is true they said we are informed so few of our party and have been so mean as to borrow their subsistence from you but the rest infinitely the greater number and especially we french and english were so far from stooping to so base an example and that there never passed till this very hour six words between us for our horses were of our own breeding our arms of our own forging and our clothes of our own cutting out and sewing plato was came by chance up on the next shelf and observing those that spoke to be in the ragged plight mentioned a while ago their jades lean and foundered their weapons of rotten wood their armour rusty and nothing but rigs underneath he laughed loud and in his pleasant way swore by god now the moderns had not proceeded in their late negotiation with secrecy enough to escape the notice of the enemy for those advocates who had begun the quarrel by setting first on foot the dispute of prudency talked so loud of coming to a battle that sir william temple happened to overhear them and gave immediate intelligence to the ancients who thereupon drew up their scattered troops together resolving to act upon the defensive upon which several of the moderns fled over to their party and among the rest temple himself this temple having been educated and long conversed among the ancients was of all the moderns their greatest favourite and became their greatest champion things were at this crisis when a material accident fell out for upon the highest corner of a large window there dwelt a certain spider swollen up to the first magnitude by the destruction of infinite numbers of flies whose spoils lay scattered before the gates of the, his palace like human bones before the cave of some giant the avenues to his castle were guarded with turnpikes and palisados all after the modern way of fortification after you had passed several courts you came to the centre wherein you might behold the constable himself in his own lodgings which had windows fronting to each avenue and ports to sally out upon all occasions or prey or defence in this mansion he had for some time dwelt in peace and plenty without danger to his person by swallows from above or to his palace by brooms from below when it was the pleasure of fortune to conduct thither and wandering bee to whose curiosity a broken pane in the glass had discovered itself and in he went where expatiating a while he at last happened to alight upon one of the outward walls of the spider's citadel which yielding to the unequal weight sunk down to the very foundation thrice he endeavoured to force his passage and thrice this centre shook the spider within feeling the terrible convulsion supposed at first that nature was approaching to her final dissolution or else that beelzebub with all his legions was come to revenge the death of many thousands of his subjects from his enemy had slain and devoured 
however at he at length valiantly resolved to issue forth and meet his fate meanwhile the bee had quitted himself of his toils and posted securely at some distance was employed in cleansing his wings and disengaging them from the ragged remnants of the cobweb by this time the spider was adventured out when beholding the chasms the ruins and dilapidations of his fortress he was very near at his wit's end he stormed and swore like a madman and swelled till he was ready to burst at length casting his eye upon the bee and wisely gathering causes from events for they know each other by sight a plague split you said he it is you with a vengeance that have made this letter here could not you look before you and be dead do you think i have nothing else to do in the devil's name but to mend and repair after you good friends friend said the bee having now pruned himself and being disposed to draw i'll give you my hand and word to come near your kennel no more i was never in such a confounded pickle since i was born sirrah replied the spider if it were not for breaking an old custom in our family never to stir abroad against the enemy i should come and teach you better manners i pray have patience said the bee or you'll spend your substance and for aught i see you may stand in need of it all towards the repair of your house rogue rogue replied the spider yet methinks you should have more respect to a person whom all the world allows to be so much your betters by my troth said the bee the comparison will amount to a very good jest and you will do me a favour to let me know the reasons that all the world is pleased to use in so hopeful a dispute at this the spider having swelled himself into the size and posture of a disputant began his argument in the true spirit of controversy with resolution to be heartily scurrilous and angry to urge on his own reasons without the least regard to the answers or objections of his opposite and fully predetermined in his mind against all conviction not to disparage myself said he by the comparison with such a rascal what are thou but a vagabond without house or home without stock or inheritance born to no possession of your own but a pair of wings and a drone pipe your livelihood is a universal plunder upon nature a freebooter over fields and gardens and for the sake of stealing will rob a nettle as easily as a violet whereas i am a domestic animal furnished with a native stock within myself this large castle to show my improvements in the mathematics is all built with my own hands and the materials extracted altogether out of my own person i am glad answered the bee to hear your grant at least that i am come honestly by my wings and my voice for then it seems i am obliged to heaven alone for my flights and my music and providence would never have bestowed on me two such gifts without designing them for the noblest ends i visit indeed all the flowers and blossoms of the field and garden but whatever i collect thence enriches myself without the least injury to their beauty their smell or their taste now for you and your skill in architecture and other mathematics i have little to say in that building of yours there might for aught i know have been labour and method enough but by woeful experience for us both it is too plain the materials are not and i hope you will henceforth take warning and consider duration and matter as well as method and art you boast indeed of being obliged to no other creature but of drawing and spinning out all from yourself that is to say if we may judge of the liquor in the vessel by what issues out you possess a good plentiful store of dirt and poison in your breast and though i would by no means lessen or disparage your genuine stock of either yet i doubt you are somewhat obliged for an increase of both 
to a little foreign assistance your inherent portion of dirt does not fall of acquisitions by sweepings exalted from below and one insect furnishes you from a share of poison to destroy another so that in short the question comes all to this whether is the nobler being of the two that which by a lazy contemplation of four inches round by an overweening pride feeding and endangering on itself turns all into excrement and venom producing nothing at all but flybane so that in short the question comes all to this whether is the nobler being of the two that which by a lazy contemplation of four inches round by an overweening pride feeding and engendering on itself turns all into excrement and venom producing nothing at all but flybane and cobweb or that which by universal range with long search much study true judgment and distinction of things brings home honey and wax this dispute was managed with such eagerness clamour and warmth that the two parties of books in arms below stood silent a while waiting in suspense that would be the issue which was not long undetermined for the bee grown impatient at so much loss of time fled straight away to a bed of roses without looking for a reply and left the spider like an orator collected in himself and just prepared to burst out it happened upon this emergency that aesop broke silence first he had been of late most barbiously threatened by a strange effect of the regent's humanity who had torn off his title-page sorely defaced one half of his leaves and chained him fast among a shelf of moderns where soon discovering how high the quarrel was likely to proceed he tried all his arts and turned himself to a thousand forms at length in the borrowed shape of an ass the regent mistook him for a modern by which means he had time and opportunity to escape to the ancients just when the spider and the bee were entering into their contest to which he gave a his intention with a world of pleasure and when it was ended swore in the loudest key that in all his life he had never known two cases so parallel and adapt to each other as that in the window and this upon the shelves the disputants said he have admirably managed the dispute between them have taken in full strength of all that is to be said on both sides and exhausted the substance of every argument pro and con it is but to adjust the reasonings of both to the present quarrel than to compare and apply the labours and fruits of each uh, as the bee has learnedly deduced them and we shall find the conclusion fall plain and close upon the moderns and us for pray gentlemen was ever anything so modern as a spire in his air he turns and his paradox he urges in the behalf of you his brethren and himself with many boastings of his native stock and great genius that he spins and spits wholly from himself and scorns to own any obligation or assistance from without then he displays to you his great skill in architecture and improvement in his the mathematics to all this the bee as an advocate retained by us the ancients thinks fit to answer that if one may judge of the great genius or inventions of the moderns by what they have produced you will hardly have countenance to bear you out in boasting of either erect your schemes with as much method and skill as you please yet if the materials be nothing but dirt spun out of your own entrails the guts of modern brains the evidence will conclude at last in a cobweb the duration of which like that of other spiders webs may be imputed to their being forgotten or neglected or hid in a corner for anything else of genuine that the moderns may pretend to i cannot recollect unless it be a large vein of wrangling and satire much of a nature and substance with the spider's poison which however they pretend to spit wholly out of themselves 
it is improved by the same arts by feeding upon the insects and vermin of the age as for us the ancients we are content with the bee to pretend to nothing of our own beyond our wings and our voice that is to say our flights and our language for the rest whatever we have got has by infinite labour and search and ranging through every corner of nature the difference is that instead of dirt and poison we have rather chosen to till our hives with honey and wax thus furnishing mankind with two noblest of things which are sweetness and light end of section one part one read by elijah fisher Section two of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section two, part two. It is wonderful to conceive the tumult arisen among the books upon the close of this long descent of Aesop. Both parties took the hint and heightened their animosities so on a sudden that they resolved it should come to a battle immediately the two main bodies withdrew under their several ensigns to the farther parts of the library and there entered into cabals and consults upon the present emergency the moderns were in very warm debates upon the choice of their leaders and nothing less than the fear impending from their enemies could have kept to them from mutinies upon this occasion the difference was greatest among the horse where every private trooper pretended to the chief command from tasso and milton to dryden and wither the light horse were commanded by cowley and despral there came the bowmen under their valiant leaders descartes Gassendi, and hobbs whose strength was such that they could shoot their arrows beyond the atmosphere never to fall down again but turn like that of evander into meteors or like the cannon-ball into stars parasolus brought a squadron of stink-pot flingers from the snowy mountains of rahtia there came a vast body of dragoons of different nations under the leading of harvey their great aga part armed with scythes the weapons of death part with lances and long knives all steeped in poison part shot bullets of a most malignant nature and used white powder which infallibly killed without report there came several bodies of heavy armed foot all mercenaries under the ensigns of guisardini davila polydor virgil buchanan mariana camden and others the engineers were commanded by regiomontanus and wilkins the rest was a confused multitude led by scotus equinus and bellarmine of mighty bulk and stature but without either arms courage or discipline in the last place came infinite swarms of calonies a disorderly rout led by lestrange rogues and ragamuffins that fell the camp for nothing but the plunder all without coats to cover them the army of the ancients was much fewer in number homer led the horse and pinder the light horse euclid was chief engineer plato and aristotle commanded the bowmen herodotus and levy the foot hippocrates the dragoons the alleys led by Vosius and temple brought up the rear all things violently tending to a decisive battle fame who much frequented and had a large apartment formerly assigned her in the regal library fled up straight to jupiter to whom she delivered a faithful account of all that passed between the two parties below for among the gods she always tells truth jove in great concern convokes a council in the milky way the senate assembled he declares the occasion of convening them 
a bloody battle just independent between two mighty arms of ancient and modern creatures called books wherein the celestial interest was much too deeply concerned momus the patron of the moderns made an excellent speech in their favour which was answered by pallas the protectress of the ancients the assembly was divided in their affections when jupiter commanded the book of fate to be laid before him immediately were brought in by mercury three large volumes in folio containing memoirs of all things past present and to come the claps were of several double the covers of celestial turkey leather and the papers such as here on earth might pass amongst for vellum jupiter having suddenly read the decree would communicate the import to none but presently shut up the book without the doors of this assembly there attended a vast number of light nimble gods menial servants to jupiter those are his ministering instruments in all affairs below they travel in a caravan more or less together and are fastened to each other like a link of galley slaves by a light chain which passes from them to jupiter's great toe and yet in receiving or delivering a message they may never approach above the lowest step of his throne where he and they whisper to each other whether through a large hollow trunk these deities are called by mortal men accidents or events but the gods call them second causes jupiter having delivered his message to a certain number of these divinities they flew immediately down to the pinnacle of the regal library and consulting a few minutes entered unseen and disposed the parties according to their orders meanwhile momus fearing the worst and calling to mind an ancient prophecy which bore no very good face to his children the moderns bent his flight to the region of a malignant deity called criticism she dwelt on the top of a snowy mountain in nova zembla there a momus found her extended in her den upon the spoils of numberless volumes half devoured at her right hand sat ignorance her father and husband blind with age at her left pride her mother dressing her up in the scrapes of paper herself had torn there was opinion her sister light of foot hood-winked and headstrong yet giddy and perpetually turning about her played her children noise and impudence dullness and vanity positiveness pedantry and ill manners the goddess herself had claws like a cat her head and ears and voice resembled those of an ass her teeth fallen out before her eyes turned inward as if she looked only upon herself her diet was the overflowing of her own gall her spleen was so large as to stand prominent like a dug of the first rate nor wanted excrescence in form of treats at which a crew of ugly monsters were greedily sucking and what is wonderful to conceive the bulk of spleen increased faster than the sucking could diminish it goddess said momus can you sit idly here while our devout worshippers the moderns are this minute entering into a cruel battle and perhaps now lying under the swords of their enemies who then hereafter will sacrifice or build altars to our divinities haste therefore to the british isle and if possible prevent their destruction while i make factions among the gods and gain them over to our party momus having thus delivered himself stayed not for an answer but left the goddess to her own resentment up she rose in rage and as it is the form on such occasions being a soliloquy it is i she said who give wisdom to infants and idiots by my children grow wiser than their parents by me biox become politicians and schoolboys judges of philosophy by me sophisters debate and conclude upon the depths of knowledge and coffee-house wits instinct by me can correct an author's style and display his minutes errors without understanding a syllable of his matter or his language by me striplings spend their judgment as they do their estate before it comes into their hands it is i 
who have disposed wit and knowledge from their empire over poetry, and advanced myself in their steed. And shall a few upstart ancients dare to oppose me? But come, my aged parent, and you, my children, dear, and thou, my beauty's sister, let us ascend my chariot, and haste to assist our devout moderns, who are now sacrificing to us a hecticon, as I perceive by that grateful smell which from thence reaches my nostrils. The goddess of her train, having mounted the chariot, which was drawn by tame geese, flew over infinite regions, shedding her influence in due places, till at length she arrived at her beloved island of Britain. But, in hovering over its metropolis, what blessings did she not let fall upon her seminaries of Gresham and Convent Garden? And now she reached the fatal plain of St. James Library, at what time the two armies were upon the point to engage, where, entering with all her caravan unseen, and landing upon a case of shelves now as a cert, but once inhabited by a colony of virtuous, she stayed a while to observe the posture of both armies. But here the tender cares of a mother began to fill her thoughts and move in her breast, for, at the top of a troop of modern bowmen, she cast her eyes upon her son Watton, to whom the fates had assigned a very short thread. Watton, a young hero, whom an unknown father of mortal race, begot by stolen embraces with this goddess. He was the darling of his mother above all her children, and resolved to go and comfort him. But first, according to the good old custom of deities, she cast about to change her shape, for fears the divinity of her countenance might dazzle his mortal sight and overcharge the rest of senses. She therefore gathered up her person into an octavo compass, her body grew white and arid, and split in pieces with dryness, the thick turned into pasteboard, and the thin into paper, upon which her parents and children artfully strewed a black juice, or decocation of gall and soot, in form of letters, her head and voice and spleen kept their primitive form, and that which before was a cover of skin did still continue so. In this guise she marched on towards the moderns, indistinguishable in shape and dress from the divine Bentley, Watton's fair dearest friend. Brave Watton, said the goddess, why do our troops stand idle here to spend their present vigor and opportunity of the day? Away! Let us haste to the generals and advise to give the onset immediately. Having spoke thus, she took the ugliest of her monsters, full gutled from her spleen, and flung it invisibly into his mouth, which, flying straight up into his head, squeezed out his eyeballs, gave him a distorted look, and half overturned his brain. Then she privately ordered two of her beloved children, dullness and ill manners, closely to attend her person in all encounters. Having thus accorded him, she vanished him in a mist, and the hero perceived it was the goddess his mother. The destined hour of fate being now arrived, the flight began, whereof, before I dare adventure to make a particular description, I must, after the example of authors, petition for a hundred tongues and mouths and hands and pens, which would all be too little to perform so immense a work. Say, goddess, that president over history, who it was that first advanced in the field of battle. Parasilus, at the head of his dragoons, observing Galen in the adverse wing, darted his javelin with a mighty force, which the brave ancient received upon his shield, the point breaking in the second fold. Hic paca descend. They bore the wounded Ego on their shields to his chariot. Descend. Nanulla. Then Aristotle, observing Bacon, advanced with a furious million, drew his bow to the head, and let fly his arrows, which missed the valiant modern, and went whizzing over his head. But Descartes it hit. The steel point quickly found a defect in the headpiece. He pierced the leather and the pasteboard, and went in at his right eye. The torturer of the pain whirled the valiant bowman round till death like a star of superior influence, drew him into his own vortex. Ingens hiatus. Hic 
in Emsis. When Homer appeared at the head of the cavalry, mounted on a furious horse, with difficulty managed by the rider himself, but which no other mortal does approach, he rode among the enemy's ranks, and bore down all before him. Say, goddess, whom he slew first, and whom he slew last. First, Gundibert advanced against him, clad in heavy armor, and mounted on a staid sober gilding, not so famed for his speed as his docility in kneeling wherever his rider would mount or alight. He had made a vow to Pallas that he would never leave the field till he had spoiled Homer of his armor. Madman, who had never once seen the wearer, nor understood his strength. Him Homer overthrew, horse and man, to the ground, there to be trampled and choked in the dirt. Then, with a long spear, he slew Denham, a stout modern, who, from his father's side, derived his lineage from Apollo, but his mother was of mortal race. He fell and bit the earth. The celestial part, Apollo, took and made it a star but the terrestrial lay wallowing upon the ground then homer slew sam wesley with a kick of his horse's heel he took peralt by mighty force out of his saddle then hurled him at fontenelle with the same blow dashing out both their brains on the left wing of the horse virgil appeared in shining armor and completely fitted to his body he was mounted on a dapple gray steed the slowness of whose pace was an effect of the highest metal and vigor. He cast his eye on the adverse wing, with a desire to find an object worthy of his valor, when, behold, upon a sorrel gelding of a monstrous size, appeared a foe, issuing from among the thicket of an enemy's squadrons, but his speed was less than his nose, for his horse, old and lean, spent the dregs of his strength, in a high trot, which, though it made slow advances, yet caused a loud clashing of his armor terrible to hear. The two cavaliers had now approached within the throw of a lance, when the stranger desired a parley, and, lifting up the visor of his helmet, a face hardly appeared from within which, after a pause, was known for that of the renowned Dryden. The brave ancients suddenly started, as one possessed with surprise and disappointment together for the helmet was nine times too large for the head, which appeared situate far in the hinder part, even like the lady in a lobster, or like a mouse under a canopy of state, or like a shriveled viau from within the penthouse of a modern periwig, and the voice was suited to the visage, sounding weak and remote. Dryden, in a long range, soothed up the ancient called him father, and, by a large deduction of genealogies, made it plainly appear that they were nearly related. Then he humbly proposed an exchange of armor, as a lasting mark of hospitality between them. Virgil consented, for the goddess defendants came unseen and cast a mist before his eyes, though his was of gold and cost a hundred beeves, the others but of rusty iron. However, this glittering armor became the modern yet worse than his own. Then they agreed to exchange horses, but when it came to the trial, Dryden was afraid and utterly unable to mount. Alter hiatus in MS. Lucen appeared upon a fiery horse of admirable shape, but headstrong, bearing the rider where he list over the field, he made a mighty slaughter among the enemy's horse, which destruction, to stop, Blackmore, a famous modern, but one of the mercenaries, strenuously opposed himself, and darted his javelin with a strong hand, which, falling short of its mark, struck deep in the earth. Then loosened through a lance, but Aesculapius came unseen and turned off the point. Brave modern, said Lucen, I perceive some god protects you, for never did my arm so deceive me before. But what mortal can contend with a god? Therefore, let us fight no longer, but present gifts to each other. Lucen then bestowed on the modern a pair of spurs, 
and Blackmore gave Lucin a bridle. Haka descend. Creech. But the goddess Dolness took a cloud, formed it into the shape of Horus, armed and mounted and placed in a flying posture before him. Glad was the cavalier to begin a combat with a flying foe, and pursued the image, threatening aloud, till at last it led him to the peaceful bower of his father, Ogilby, by whom he was disarmed and assigned to his repose. Then Pinder slew, and, and Oldham, and Aphra, the Amazon, Lighterfoot, never advancing in a direct line, but wheeling with incredible agility and force, he made a terrible slaughter among the enemy's light horse. Him, when Cowley observed, his generous heart burnt within him, and he advanced against the fierce ancient, imitating his address, his pace, and career, as well as the vigour of his horse and his own skill would allow. When the two cavaliers had approached within the length of three javelins, first Cowley threw a lance which missed Pindar, and, passing into the enemy's ranks, fell intellectual to the ground. Then Pindar darted a javelin so large and weighty that scarce a dozen cavaliers, as cavaliers in our degenerate days, could raise it from the ground. Yet he threw it with ease, and it went, by an unerring hand, singing through the air, nor could the moderns have avoided present death if he had not luckily opposed the shield that had been given him by Venus. And now both heroes drew their swords, but the moderns was so aghast and disordered that he knew not where he was. His shield dropped from his hands, thrice he fled, and thrice he could not escape. At last he turned, and lifting up his hand in the posture of a suppliant, Godlike Pindar, he said, spare my life and possess my horse with these arms, beside the ransom which my friends will give when they hear I am alive and your prisoner. Dog, said Pindar, let your ransom stay with you, friends, but your carcass shall be left for the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. With that he raised his sword, and with a mighty stroke, cleft the wretched modern in twain, the sword pursuing the blow, and one half lay panting on the ground, to be trodden pieces by the horse's feet, the other half was borne by the frightened steed through the field. This Venus took, washed it seven times in ambrosia, then struck it thrice with a sprig of amaranth, upon which the leather grow round and soft, and the leaves turned into feathers, and, being gilded before, continued gilded still, so it became a dove, and she harnessed it to her chariot. Itus Valdi D. Flindus in MS. End of section two. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section three of the Battle of the Books. This Lipperfox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section three. The Episode of Bentley and Watton. Day being far spent, and the numerous forces of the moderns having plainly to a retreat, there issued forth from a squadron of their heavy armed foot a captain whose name was Bentley, the most deformed of all the moderns, tall but without shape or comeliness, large but without strength or proportion. His armor was patched up of a thousand incoherent pieces, and the sound of it as he marched, was loud and dry, like that made by the fall of a sheet of lead, which an Etesian wind blows suddenly down from the roof of some steeple. His helmet was of old rusty iron, but the visor was brass, which, tainted by his breath, corrupted into copperous, nor wanted gall from the same fountain, so that, whenever provoked by anger or labor, and a tremendous quality of most malignant nature was seen to distill from his lips. It, in his right hand he grasped a flail, and, that he might never be unprovided of inoffensive weapon, 
a vessel full of a door in his left thus completely armed he advanced with a slow and heavy pace where the modern chiefs were holding a consult upon the sum of things who as he came onwards laughed to behold his crooked leg and humped shoulder which his boot and armour vainly endeavouring to hide were forced to comply with and expose the generals made use of him for his talent of railing which kept within government proved frequently of great service to their cause but at other times did more mischief than good for at the least touch of offence and often without any at all he would like a wounded elephant convert it against his leaders such at this juncture was the disposition of bentley grieved to see the enemy prevail and dissatisfied with everybody's conduct but his own he humbly gave the modern generals to understand that he conceived with great submission they were all a pack of rogues and fools and confounded loggerheads and illiterate whelps and nonsensical scoundrels that if himself had been constituted general those presumptuous dogs the ancients would long before this have been beaten out of the field you said he sit here idle but when i or any other valiant modern kill an enemy you are sure to seize the spoil but i will not march one foot against the foe till you all swear to me that whomever i take or kill his arms i shall quietly possess bentley having spoken thus Scalger bestowing him a sour look miss creamed prater said he eloquent in thine own eyes thou railest without wit or truth or discretion the malignity of thy temper perverteth nature thy learning mistakes thee more barbarous thy study of humanity more inhuman thy converse among poets more grovelling murray and dull all arts of civilizing others render thee rude and untractable courts have taught thee ill manners and polite conversation has finished thee a pedant besides a greater coward burdeneth not the army but never despond i pass my word whatever spoil thou takest shall certainly be thy own though i hope that vile carcass will first become a prey to kites and worms bentley durst not reply but half choked with spleen and rage withdrew in full resolution of performing some great achievement with him for his aid and companion he took his beloved watton resolving by policy or surprise to attempt some neglected quarter of the ancient's army they began their march over carcasses of their slaughtered friends them to the right of their own forces then wheeled northward till they came to eldrovandus's tomb which they passed on the side of the declining sun and now they arrived with fear toward the enemy's outguards looking about if haply they might spy the quarters of the wounded or some straggling sleepers unarmed and remote from the rest as when two mongrel curs whom native greediness and domestic want provoke and join in partnership though fearful nightly to invade the folds of some rich grazer they with tails depressed and lolling tongues creep soft and slow meanwhile the conscious moon now in her zenith on their guilty heads starts perpendicular rays nor dare they bark though much provoked at her refulgent visage whether seen in a puddle by reflection or in sphere direct but one surveys the region round while the other scouts the plain if haply to discover at distance from the flock some carcass half devoured 
the refuse of gorged wolves or ominous ravens. So march this lovely, loving pair of friends, nor with less fear and circumspection, when at a distance they might perceive two shining suits of armor hanging upon an oak, and the owners not far off in a profound sleep. The two friends drew lots, and the pursuing of this adventure fell to Bentley, and on he went, and, in his van confusion and amaze, while horror and affright brought up the rear, as he came near, behold two heroes of the ancient army, Phalaris and Aesop, lay fast asleep. Bentley would fain have dispatched them both, and, stealing close, aimed his flail at Phalaris's breast. But then the goddess of fright, interposing, caught the modern in her icy arms, and dragged him from the danger she foresaw. Both of the dormant heroes happened to turn at the same instant, though soundly sleeping, and busy in a dream. For Phalaris was just that minute dreaming how a most vile potaster had lampooned him, and how he had got him roaring in his bowl and Aesop dreamed that as he and the ancient were lying on the ground, a wild ass broke loose, ran about, trampling and kicking in their faces. Bentley, leaving the two heroes asleep, seized on both their armors, and withdrew in quest of his darling Watton. He, in the meantime, had wandered long in search of some enterprise, till at length he arrived at a small rivulet that issued from a fountain hard by, called in the language of mortal men, Helicon. Here he stopped, and, parched with thirst, resolved to ally it in this limpid stream. Thrice with profane hands he essayed to raise the water to his lips, and thrice it slipped all through his fingers. Then he stopped prone on his breast, but, ere his mouth had kissed the liquid crystal, Apollo came, and in the channel held his shield betwixt the modern and the fountain, so that he drew up nothing but mud. For although no fountain on earth can compare with the clearness of Helicon, yet there lies at bottom a thick sentiment of slime and mud. For so Apollo begged of Jupiter, as a punishment to those who durst attempt to taste it with unhallowed lips, and, for a lesson, to all not to draw it too deep or far from the spring. At the fountain head Watton discerned two heroes, the one he could not distinguish, but the other was soon known for Temple, general of the allies to the ancients. His back was turned, and he was employed in drinking large draughts in his helmet from the fountain, where he had withdrawn himself to rest from the toils of the war. Watton, observing him, with quaking knees and trembling hands, spoke thus to himself, Oh, that I could kill this destroyer of our army! What renown should I purchase among the chiefs? But you issue our against him, man against man, shield against shield, and lance against lance. What modern of us dare? For he fights like a god, and Pallas or Apollo are ever at his elbow. But, oh, mother, if what fame reports be true, that I am the son of so great a goddess, grant me to hit the temple with the slant that the stroke may send him to hell, and that I may return in safety and triumph, laden with the spoils. The first part of this prayer the gods granted at the intercession of his mother and of Momus, but the rest, by a perverse wind sent from fate, was scattered in the air. Then Watton grasped his lance, and, brandishing it thrice over his head, darted it with all his might. The goddess, his mother, at the same time adding strength to his arm. Away the lance went hissing, and reached even to the belt of the averted ancient, upon which, lately grazed, it fell to the ground. Temple neither felt the weapon touch him, nor heard it fall, and Watton might have escaped to his army, with the honor of having remitted his lance against so great a leader, unrevenged. But Apollo, enraged that a javelin flung by the assistance of so foul a goddess should pollute his fountain, put on the shape of and softly came to young Boyle, who then accompanied Temple. He pointed first to the lance, 
than to the distant modern that flung it, and commanded the young hero to take immediate revenge. Boyle, clad in a suit of armor, which had been given him by all the gods, immediately advanced against the trembling foe, who now fled before him. As a young lion in the Libyan plains, or Arabi desert, sent by his aged shire to hunt for prey, or health, or exercise, he scores along, wishing to meet some tiger from the mountains, or a furious boar, if chance a wild ass, with brangs importune, in fronts his ear, the generous beast, though loathing to disdain his claws with blood so vile, yet much provoked at the advance of the noise, which echo, foolish nymph, like her ill-judging sex, repeats much louder, and with more delight than Philomela's song, he vindicates the honor of the forest and hunts the noisy long-eared animal. So Watton fled, so Boyle pursued. But Watton, heavy-armed and slow afoot, began to slack his course when his lover Bentley appeared, returning laden with the spoils of the two sleeping ancients. Boyle observed him well, and soon, discovering the helmet and shield of Phalaris's friend, both which he had lately, with his own hands, new polished and give. Rage sparkled in his eyes, and, leaving his pursuit after Watton, he furiously rushed on against this new approacher. Fain would he be revenged on both, but now fled different ways, and, as a woman in a little house, that gets a painful livelihood by spinning if chance her geese be scattered or the common she courses round plain from side to side compelling here and there the stragglers to the flock they cackle loud and flutter o'er the champagne so boyle pursued so fled this pair of friends finding at length their flight was vain they bravely joined and drew themselves and Flannox. First, Bentley threw a spear with all his force, hoping to pierce the enemy's breast. But Pallas came unseen, and in the air took off the point, and clapped on one of lead, which, after a dead bang against the enemy's shield, fell blunted to the ground. Then Boyle, observing well his time, took up a lance of wondrous length and sharpness, and, as the pair of friends compacted, stood close side by side. He wheeled him to the right, and, with unusual force, darted the weapon. Bentley saw his fate approach, and flinking down his arms close to his ribs, hoping to save his body, in went the point, passing through arm and side, nor stopped or spent its force till it had also pierced the valiant Watton, who, going to disdain his dying friend, shared his fate. As when a skilful cook has trusted a brace of woodcocks, he, with iron skewer, pierces the tender sides of both their legs and wings, close pinned to the rib. So was this pair of friends, transfixed, till down they fell, joined in their lives, joined in their deaths, so closely joined that Charon would mistake them both for one, and raft them over sticks, for half his fare. Farewell, beloved, loving pair, few equals have you left behind, and happy immortal shall you be, if all my wit and eloquence can make you. And now, descent quotera. End of section three. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section four of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section 4. A Meditation Upon a Broomstick. According to the style and manner of Honorary Robert Boyle's Meditations. This single stick, which you now behold, ingloriously lying in that neglected corner, I once knew in a flourishing state in a forest. It was full of sap, full of leaves, and full of bows. But now, in vain, does the busy art of man pretend to vie with nature. 
by tying that withered bundle of twigs to its sapless trunk. It is now, at best, but the reverse of what it was. A tree turned upside down, the branches on the earth, and the root in the air. It is now handled by every dirty wench, condemned to do her drudgery, and, by a capricious kind of fate, destined to make other things clean, and be nasty itself, at length, worn to the stumps and the service of the maids. It is either thrown out of doors or condemned to the last use of kindling a fire. When I behold this, I sighed and said within myself, Surely mortal man is a broomstick. Nature sent him into the world strong and lusty, in a thriving condition, wearing his own hair on his head, the proper branches of this raising vegetable till the axe of intemperance has lopped off his green bows and left him a withered trunk he then flies to art and puts on a periwig valling himself upon an unnatural bundle of hairs all covered with powder that never grew on his head but now should this our broomstick pretend to enter the scene proud of those birchen spoils it never bore and all covered with dust through the sweepings of the finest lady's chamber we should be apt to ridicule and despise its vanity partial judges that we are of our own excellencies and other men's defaults but a broomstick perhaps you will say is an emblem of a tree standing on its head and pray what is a man but a topsy-turvy creature his animal faculties perpetually mounted on his rational his head where his heels should be grovelling on the earth and yet with all his faults he sets up to be a universal reformer and corrector of his abuses a reformer of grievances breaks into every slit's corner of nature bringing hidden corruptions to the light and raises a mighty dust where there was none before sharing deeply all the while in the very same pollutions he pretends to sweep away his last days are spent in slavery to women, and generally the least deserving, till, worn to the stumps, like his brother Bosom, he is either kicked out of doors, or made use of to kindle flames for others to warm themselves by. End of section 4. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 5 of the Battle of the Books this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books by Jonathan Swift. Section 5. Predictions for the Year 1708. Wherein the month and day of the month are set down, the persons named, and the great actions and events of the next year, particularly related, as will come to pass. Written to prevent the people of England from being farther imposed on by vulgar almanac makers by Isaac Bickerstaff, Esquire. I have long considered the gross abuse of astrology in this kingdom, and upon debating the matter with myself, I could not possibly lay the fault upon the art, but upon those gross imposters who set up to be the artists. I know several learned men have contended that the whole is a cheat, that it is absurd and ridiculous to imagine the stars can have any influence at all upon human actions, thoughts, or inclinations, and whoever has not been to studies that way may be excused for thinking so when he sees in how wretched a manner that noble art is treated by a few mean illiterate traders between us and the stars who import a yearly stock of nonsense lies folly and impertinence which they offer to the world as genuine from the planets though they descend from no greater a height than their own brains i intend in a short time to publish a large and rational defense of this art, and therefore say no more in this justification at present that it hath been in all ages defended by learned men, and among the rest by Socrates himself, whom I look upon as undoubtedly the wisest and uninspired mortals, to which, if we add that those who have condemned this art, though otherwise learned, having been such as either did not apply their studies this way or at least did not succeed in their applications 
their testimony will not be of much weight to its disadvantage since they are liable to the common objection of condemning what they did not understand nor am i aught all offended or think it an injury to the art when i see the common dealers in it students in astrology the philomaths and the rest of that tribe treated by wise men with the utmost scorn and contempt but rather wonder when i observe gentlemen in the country rich enough to serve the nation and parliament pouring in patridge's almanac to find out the events of the year at home and abroad not daring to propose a hunting match till gadbury or we have fixed the weather i will allow either of the two i have mentioned or any other of the fraternity not to not only astrologers but conjurers too if i do not produce a hundred instances in all their almanacs to convince any reasonable man that they do not so much as understand common grammar and syntax that they are not able to spell any word out of the usual road nor even in their prefaces write common sense or intelligible english then for their observations and predictions they are such as will equally suit any age or country in the world this month a certain great person will be threatened with death or sickness this the newspapers will tell them for there we find at the end of the year that no month passes without the death of some person of note and it would be hard if it should be otherwise when there are at least two thousand persons of note in this kingdom many of them old and the almanac maker has the liberty he of choosing the sickliest season of the year where he may fix his prediction again this month an eminent clergyman will be preferred of which there may be some hundreds half of them with one foot in the grave then such a planet in such a house shows great imaginations plots and conspiracies that may in time be brought to light after which if we hear of any discovery the astrologer gets the honour if not his prediction still stands good and at last god preserve king william from all his open and secret enemies amen when if the king should happen to have died the astrologer plainly foretold it otherwise it passes but for the pious ejaculation of a loyal subject though it unluckily happened in some of their almanacs that poor king william was prayed for many months after he was dead because it fell out that he died about the beginning of the year to mention no more of their impertinent predictions what have we to do with their advertisements about pills and drink for disease or their mutual curls in verse and prose of wig and troy wherewith the stars have little to do having long observed and lamented these and hundred other abuses of this art too tedious to repeat i resolve to proceed in a new way which i doubt not will be to the general satisfaction of the kingdom i can this year produce but a specimen of what i design for the future having employed most of my time in adjusting and correcting the calculations i made some years past because i would offer nothing to the world of which i am not fully satisfied as that i am now alive for these two last years i have not failed in above one of or two particulars and those of no very great moment i exactly foretold the miscarriage of tullan with all its particulars and the loss of admiral shovel though i was mistaken as to the day placing that accident about thirty-six hours sooner than it happened but upon reviewing my schemes i quickly found the cause of that error i likewise foretold the battle of almanza to the very day and hour with the laws on both sides and the consequences thereof at which i showed to some friends many months before they happened that is i gave them papers sealed up to open at such a time after which they were at liberty to read them and there they found my predictions true in every article except one or two at very minute as for the following predictions i now offer the world i forbore to publish them till i pursued the several almanacs for the year we are now entered on 
i find them all in the usual strain and i beg the reader will compare their manner with mine and here i make bold to tell the world that i lay the whole credit of my art upon the truth of these predictions and i will be content that patridge and the rest of his clan may hoot me for a cheat and impostor if i fail in any single particular of moment i believe any man who reads this paper will look upon me to the least a person of as much honesty and understanding as a common maker of almanacs i do not lurk in the dark i am not wholly unknown to the world i have set my name at length to be the mark of infamy to mankind if they shall find i deceive them and one thing i must desire to be forgiven that i talk more sparingly of home affairs as it will be imprudence to discover secrets of state so it would be dangerous to my person but in smaller matters and that are not of public consequence i shall be very free and the truth of my conjectures will as much appear from those as the others as for the most signal events abroad in france flanders italy and spain i shall make no scruple to protect them in plain terms some of them are of importance and i hope i shall seldom mistake the day they will happen and therefore i think good to inform the reader that i all along make use of the old style observed in england which i desire he will compare with that of the newspapers at the time they relate to the actions i mention i must add one word more i know it hath been the opinion of several of the learned who think well enough of the true art of astrology that the stars do only incline and do not force the action or wills of men and therefore however i may proceed by right rules yet i cannot in prudence so confidently assure the events will follow exactly as i predict them i hope i have maturely considered this objection which in some cases is of no little weight for example a man may by the influence of an overruling planet to be disposed or inclined to lust rage or avarice and yet by the force of reason overcome that bad influence and this was the case of socrates but as the great events of the world usually depend upon numbers of men it cannot be expected they should all unite to cross their inclinations from pursuing a general design wherein they unanimously agree besides the influence of the stars reaches too many actions and events which are not any way in the power of reason as sickness death and what we commonly call accidents with many more needless to repeat but now it is time to proceed to my predictions which i have begun to calculate from the time that the sun enters into aries and thus i take to be properly the beginning of the natural year i pursue them to the time that he enters libra or somewhat more which is the busy period of the year the remainder i have not yet adjusted upon account of several impediments needless here to mention besides i must remind the reader again that this is but a specimen of what i design in succeeding years to treat more at large if i may have liberty and encouragement my first prediction is but a trifle yet i mention it to show how ignorant those daughtershipery tenders to astrology are in their own concerns it relates to patridge the almanac maker i have consulted the stars of his nativity by my own rules and find he will infallibly die upon the twenty-fourth ninth of march next about eleven at night of a raging fever therefore i advise him to consider of it and settle his affairs in time the month of april will be observable for the death of many great persons on the fourth will die the cardinal de nolles archbishop of paris on the eleventh the young prince of austrius son to the duke anjou on the fourteenth a great peer of this realm will die at his country house on the nineteenth an old layman of great fame for learning and on the twenty-third an eminent goldsmith in lombard street i could mention others both at home and abroad if i did not consider it is of very little use or instruction to the reader or to the world as to public affairs on the seventh of this month there will be an insurrection in dauphiny occasioned by the oppressions of the people which will not be quieted in some months 
on the fifteenth will be a violent storm on the southeast coast of france which will destroy many of their ships and some in the very harbor the eleventh will be famous for the revolt of a whole province of her kingdom excepting one city by which the affairs of a certain prince and the alliance will take a better face may against common conjectures will be no very busy month in europe but very signal for the death of the dolphin which will happen on the seventh after a short fit of sickness and grievous torments with the strangery he dies less lamented by the court than the kingdom on the ninth a marshal of france will break his leg by a fall from his horse i have not been able to discover whether he will then die or not on the eleventh will begin a most important siege which the eyes of all europe will be upon i cannot be more particular for in relating affairs that so nearly concern the confederates and consequently this kingdom i am forced to confine myself for several reasons very obvious to the reader on the fifteenth news will arrive of a very surprising event that which nothing could be more unexpected on the nineteenth three noble ladies of this kingdom will against all expectation prove with child to the great joy of their husbands on the twenty-third a famous buffoon of the playhouse will die a ridiculous death suitable to his vocation june this month will be distinguished at home by the utter dispersing of those ridiculous deluded enthusiasts commonly called the prophets occasioned chiefly by seeing the time come that many of their prophecies should be fulfilled and then finding themselves deceived by contrary events it is indeed to be admired how any deceiver can be so weak to foretell things near at hand when a very few months must of necessity discover the impostor to all the world in this point less prudent than common almanac makers who are so wise to ponder in generals and talk dubiously and leave to the reader the business of interpreting on the first of this month a french general will be killed by a random shot of a cannon-ball on the sixth a fire will break out in the suburbs of paris which will destroy above a thousand houses and seems to be the foreboding of what will happen to the surprise of all europe about the end of the following month on the sixth a fire will break out in the suburbs of paris which will destroy above a thousand houses and seems to be the foreboding of what will happen to the surprise of all europe about the end of the following month on the tenth a great battle will be fought which will begin at four o'clock in the afternoon and last until nine at night with great obstinacy but no very decisive event i shall not name the place for the reasons aforesaid but the commanders on each left wing will be killed i see bonfires and hear the noise of guns for a victory on the fourteenth there will be a false report of the french king's death on the twentieth cardinal portocaro will die of a dying century with great suspicion of poison but the report of his intention to revolt to king charles will prove false july the sixth of this month a certain general will by a glorious action recover the reputation he lost by former misfortunes on the twelfth a great commander will die a prisoner in the hands of his enemies on the fourteenth a shameful discovery will be made of a french jesuit giving poison to a great foreign general and when he is put to the torture will make wonderful discoveries in short this will prove a month of great action if i might have liberty to relate the particulars at home the death of an old famous senator will happen on the fifteenth at his country house worn with age and diseases but that which will make this month memorable to all posterity is the death of the king louis the fourteenth after a week sickness at marly which will happen on the twenty ninth about six o'clock in the evening it seems to be an effect of the gout in his stomach followed by a flux and in three days after monsieur chamillard will follow his master dying suddenly of an apoplexy in this month likewise an ambassador will die in london but i cannot assign the day august the affairs of france will seem to suffer no change for a while under the duke of burgundy's administration but the genius that animated the whole machine being gone will be the cause of mighty turns and revolutions in the following year 
the new king makes yet little change either in the army or in the ministry but the libels against his grandfather that fly about his very court give him uneasiness i see and express in mighty haste with joy and wonder in his looks arriving by break of the day on the twenty sixth of this month having travelled in three days a prodigious journey by land and sea in the evening i hear bells and guns and see the blazing of a thousand bonfires a young admiral of noble birth does likewise this month gain immortal honour by a great achievement the affairs of poland are this month entirely settled augustus resigns his pretensions which he had again taken up for some time stanislaus is peaceably possessed of the throne and the king of sweden declares for the emperor i cannot omit one particular accident here at home that near the end of this month much mischief will be done at bartholomew fair by the fall of a booth september this month begins with a very surprising fit of frosty weather which will last near twelve days the pope having long languished last month the swellings of his legs breaking and the flesh mortifying will die on the eleventh instant and in three weeks time after a mighty contest be succeeded by a cardinal of the imperial faction but native of tuscany who is now about sixty-one years old the french army acts now wholly on the defensive strongly fortified in their trenches and the young french king sends ouventure for a treaty of peace by the duke of mantua which because it is a matter of state that concerns us here at home i shall speak no farther of it i shall add but one prediction more and that in mystical terms which shall be included in the verse out of virgil alter eret jam tethys et altera qua vehat argo delictus heroos upon the twenty-fifth of this month the fulfilling of this prediction will be manifest to everybody this is the farthest i have proceeded in my calculations for the present year i do not pretend that these are all the great events which will happen in this period but that those i have set down will infallibly come to pass it will perhaps still be objected why i have not spoken more to particularly of affairs at home or of the success of our armies abroad which you might and could very largely have done but those in power have wisely discouraged men from meddling in public concerns and i was resolved by no means to give the least offence this i will venture to say that it will be a glorious campaign for the allies wherein the english forces both by sea and land will have their full share of honour that her majesty queen anne will continue in health and prosperity and that no ill accident will arrive to any in the chief ministry as to the particular events i have mentioned the readers may judge by the fulfilling of them whether i am on the level with common astrologers who with an old paltry cant and a few pooth hooks for planets to amuse the vulgar have in my opinion too long been suffered to abuse the word but an honest physician ought not to be despised because there are such things as mountebanks i hope i have some share of reputation which i would not willingly forfeit for a frolic of humour and i believe no gentleman who reads this paper will look upon it to be of the same cast or mould with the common scribblers that are every day hawked about my fortune has placed me above the little regard of scribbling for a few pence which i neither value nor want therefore let no wise man too hastily condemn this essay intended for a good design to cultivate and improve an ancient art long in disgrace by having fallen into mean and unskilful hands a little time will determine whether i have deceived others or myself and i think it is no very unreasonable request that men would please to suspend their judgments till then i was once of the opinion with those who despise all predictions from the stars till in the year sixteen eighty six a man of equality showed me written in his album that the most learned astronomer captain 
assured him he would never believe anything of the star's influence if there were not a great revolution in england in the year sixteen eighty eight since that time he began to have other thoughts and after eighteen years of diligent study and application i think i have no reason to repent of my pains i shall detain the reader no longer than to let him know that the account i design to give of next year's event shall take in the principal affairs that happen in europe and if i be denied the liberty of offering it to my own country i shall appeal to the learned world by publishing it in latin and giving order to have it printed in holland End of section five. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section six of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books by Jonathan Swift. Section six. The accomplishment of the first of Mr. Bickerstaff's predictions being an account of the death of Mr. Patridge, the almanac-maker, upon the twenty-ninth instant, in a letter to a person of honour written in the year 1708. My lord, in obedience to your lordship's commands, as well as to satisfy my own curiosity, I have for some days past inquired constantly after Patridge, the almanac-maker, of whom it was foretold Mr. Bickerstaff's predictions published about a month ago, that he should die the twenty-ninth instant, about eleven at night, of a raging fever. I had some sort of knowledge of him when I was employed in the revenue, because he used every year to present me with his almanac, as he did other gentlemen, upon the score of some little gratuity we gave him. I saw him accidentally once or twice about ten days before he died, and observed he began very much to droop and languish, though I hear his friends did not seem to apprehend him in any danger. About two or three days ago he grew ill, and was confined first to his chamber, and in a few hours after to his bed, where Dr. Case and Mrs. Curlius were sent for, to visit and to prescribe to him. Upon this intelligence, I sent thrice every day one servant or other to inquire after his health, and yesterday, about four in the afternoon, word was brought me that he was past hopes, upon which I prevailed with myself to go and see him, partly out of commiseration, and I confess, partly out of curiosity. He knew me very well, seemed surprised at my condensation, and made me compliments upon it as well as he could in the condition he was the people about him said he had been for some time delirious but when i saw him he had his understanding as well as i ever knew and spoke strong and hearty without any seeming uneasiness or constraint after i had told him how sorry i was to see him in those melancholy circumstances and said to some other civilities suitable to the occasion i desired him to tell me freely and ingenuously whether the predictions of mr bickerstaff had published relating to his death had not too much affected and worked on his imagination he confessed he had often had it in his head but never with much apprehension till about a fortnight before since which time it had been the perpetual possession of his mind and thoughts, and he did verily believe was the true natural cause of his present distemper. For, said he, I am thoroughly persuaded, and I think I have very good reasons, that Mr. Bickerstaff spoke altogether by guess, and knew no more what will happen this year than I did myself. I hold told him that his discourse surprised me, and I would be glad he was in a state of health to be able to tell me what reason he had to be convinced of Mr. Bickerstaff's ignorance. He replied, I am a poor ignorant fellow, bred to a mean trade, yet I have sense enough to know that all pretenses of foretelling by astrology are deceits. For this manifest reason, 
because the wise and the learned, who can only know whether there be any truth in this science, do all unanimously agree to laugh and despise it, and none but the poor ignorant vulgar give it any credit, and that only upon the word of such silly wretches as I and my fellows, who can hardly write or read. I then asked him why he had not calculated his own nativity, to see whether it agreed with Mr. Bickerstaff's prediction, at which he shook his head and said, Oh, sir, this is no time for jesting, but for repenting those fooleries, as I do now from the very bottom of my heart. By what I can gather from you, said I, the observations and predictions you printed with your almanacs were mere impositions on the people, he replied. If it were otherwise, I should have the less to answer for. We have a common form for all those things as to foretelling the weather. We never meddle with that but leave it to the printer, who takes it out of any old almanac as he thinks fit. The rest was my own invention, to make my almanac sell, having a wife to maintain, and no other way to get my bread, for mending old shoes is a poor livelihood, and, he added, sighing, I wish I may not have done more mischief by my physic than my astrology though I had some good receipts from my grandmother, and my own compositions were such as I thought could at least do no hurt. I had some other discourse with him, which now I cannot call to mind, and I fear I have already tried your lordship. I shall only add one circumstance, that on his deathbed he declared himself a nonconformist, and had a fanatic preacher to be his spiritual guide. After half an hour's conversation, I took my leave, being half stifled by the closeness of the room. I imagined he could not hold out long, and therefore withdrew to a little coffee-house hard by, leaving a servant at the house with orders to come immediately and tell me as nearly as he could the minute when patronage should expire, which was not above two hours after when, looking upon my watch, I found it to be above five minutes after seven, by which it is clear that Mr. Bickerstaff was mistaken almost four hours in his calculation. In the other circumstances he was exact enough, but whether he has not been the cause of this poor man's death, as well as the predictor, may be very reasonably disputed. However, it must be confessed the matter is odd enough, whether he sh should endeavor to account for it by chance, or the effect of imagination. For my own part, though, I believe no man has less faith in these matters, yet I shall wait with some impatience, and not without some expectation, the fulfilling of Mr. Bickerstaff's second prediction, that the Cardinal de Nolly is to die upon the 4th of April and if that should be verified as exactly as this of poor patronage, I must own I should be wholly surprised, and at a loss, and should infallibly expect the accomplishment of all the rest. End of Section 6 Read by Elijah Fisher Section 7 of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books by Jonathan Swift. Section 7. Bosches and Philemon. Imitated from the Eighth Book of Ovid. In ancient times, as story tells, the saints would often leave their cells and stroll about, but hide their quality to try good people's hospitality. It happened on a winter night, as authors of the legend write, two brother hermits, saints by trade, taking their tour in masquerade, disguised in tattered habits, went to a small village down in Kent, where, 
in the stroller's canting strain they begged from door to door in vain tried every tone might pity win but not a soul would let them in their wandering saints in woeful state treated at this ungodly rate having through all the village passed to a small cottage came at last where dwelt a good honest old yeoman called in the neighbourhood philemon who kindly did these saints invite in his poor hut to pass the night and then the hospitable sir bid goody boshes mend the fire while he from out the chimney took a flitch of bacon off the hook and freely from the fattest side cut out large slices to be fried then stepped aside to fetch him drink filled a large jug up to the brink and saw it fairly twice go round yet what is wonderful they found twas still replenished to the top as if their near had touched a drop the good old couple were amazed and often on each other gazed for both were frightened to the heart and just began to cry what art then softly turned aside to view whether the lights were burning blue the gentle pilgrims soon aware untold em their calling and their errand good folks you need not be afraid we are but saints the hermit said no hurt shall come to you or yours but for that pack of churlish boars not fit to live on christian ground they and their houses shall be drowned whilst you shall see your cottage rise and grow a church before your eyes they scarce had spoke when fair and soft the roof began to mount aloft aloft rose every beam and rafter the heavy wall climbed slowly after the chimney widened and grew higher became a steeple with a spire the kettle to the top was hoist and there stood fastened to a joist but with the upside down to show its inclination for below in vain for a superior force applied at bottom stops its course doomed ever in suspense to dwell tis now no kettle but a bell a wooden jack which had almost lost by disuse the art to roast a sudden alteration feels increased by new in intestine wheels and what exalts the wonder more the number made the motion slower the flyer thought had leaden feet turned round so quick you scarce could see it but slackened by some secret power now hardly moves an inch an hour the jack and chimney near ailed had never left each other's side the chimney to a steeple ground the jack would not be left alone but up against the steeple reared became a cock and still adhered and still its love to household cares by a shrill voice at noon declares warning the cookmaid not to burn the roast with meat which it cannot turn the groaning chair began to crawl like a huge snail along the wall there stuck aloft in public view and with small change a pulpit grew the porringers that in a row hung high and made a glittering show to a less noble substance changed were now but leathern buckets raged the ballads pasted on the wall of joan of france and english mall fair rosamond and robin hood the little children in the wood now seemed to look abundance better improved in picture size and letter and high in order placed describe the hilarity of every tribe a bedstead of the antique mode compact of timber many a load such as our ancestors did use was metaphorized into pews which still their ancient nature keep by lodging folks disposed to sleep the cottage by such feats as these grown to a church by just degrees 
the hermits then desired their host to ask for what he fancied most philemon having paused a while returned him thanks in homely style then said my house is grown so fine methinks i still call it mine i am old and fain would live at ease make me the parson if you please he spoke and presently he feels his grazer's coat fall down his heels he sees yet hardly can believe about each arm a pudding sleeve his waistcoat to a cassock grew and both assumed a sable hue being old continued just as threadbare and as full of dust his talk was now of thighs and dews he smoked his pipe and read his news knew how to preach old sermons next vamped in the preface of the text at christianings well could act his part and had the service all by heart wished woman might have children fast and thought whose so had furrowed last against dissenters would ripen and stood up firm for right divine but his head filled with many a system but classic authors and ere he missed him thus having furbished up a parson dame boshes next they played their fair song instead of homespun coifs where seemed good pinners edged with calbertine her petticoat trims formed a pace became blacks satin flounced with lace plain goody would no longer down twas madam in her grogram gown philemon was in great surprise and hardly could believe his eyes amazed to see her look so prim and she admired as much as him thus happy in their change of life were several years this man and wife when on a day which proved their last discoursing o'er old stories past they went by chance amidst their talk to the churchyard to take a walk when boshes hastily cried out my dear i see your forehead sprout sprout quoth the man what's this you tell us i hope you don't believe me jealous but yet methinks i feel it true and really yours is budding too nay now i cannot stir my foot it feels as if were taking root description would but tire my muse in short they both were turned to use old goodman of dobson of the green remembers he the trees has seen he'll talk of them from noon till night and goes with folks to show the sight on sundays after evening prayer he gathers all the parish there points out the place of either you here boshes their philemon grew till once a parson of our town to mend his barn cut boshes down at which tis hard to be believed how much the other tree was grieved grow scrubby died a top stunted so the next parson stubbed and burnt it end of section seven read by elijah fisher Section eight of Battle of the Books This Librivox recording is in the public domain The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section eight The Logicians Refuted Logicians have but ill defined as rational the human kind. Reason they say belongs to man, but let them prove it if they can. Wise are as Tottle and Smeglesius by ratiocination specious have strove to prove with great precision with definition and division homo est ration preditum but for my soul i cannot credit em and must in spite of them maintain that man and all his ways are vain and that this boasted lord of nature is both a weak and erring creature that instinct is a surer guide than reason boasting mortal's pride and that bruised beasts are far before em deus est enema brutorum whoever knew an honest brute at law his neighbour prosecute being action for assault and battery 
or friend beguile with lies and flattery o'er plains they ramble unconfined no politics disturb their mind they eat their meals and take their sport nor know who's in or out at court they never to the levy go to treat as dearest friend a foe they never importune his grace nor ever cringe to men in place nor undertake a dirty job nor draw the quill to write for bob fraught with invective they ne'er go to folks at paternoster row no judges fiddlers dancing masters no pickpockets or potasters are known to honest quadrupeds no single brute his fellow leads brutes never meet in bloody fray nor cut each other's throats for pay of beasts it is confessed the ape comes near is us in human shape like man he imitates each fashion and malice is his ruling passion but both in malice and grimaces a courtier any ape surpasses behold him humbly cringing wait upon the minister of state view him soon after to inferiors aping the conduct of superiors he promises with equal air and to perform takes equal care he in his turn finds imitators at court the poachers laquies waiters their master's manners still contract and footmen lords and dukes can act thus at the court both great and small behave alike for all ape all End of section eight read by elijah fisher section nine of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift section nine the puppet show the life of man to represent and turn it all to ridicule wit did a puppet show invent where the chief actor is a fool the gods of old were logs of wood and worship was to puppets paid in antic dress the idol stood and priests and people bowed the head no wonder then if art began the simple votaries to frame to shape and timber foolish man and consecrate the block to fame from hence poetic fancy learned that trees might rise from human forms the body to a trunk be turned and branches issue from the arms thus daedalus and ovid too that man's a blockhead have confessed powell and stretch the hint pursue life is the farce the world a jest a footnote powell and stretch is two puppet showmen and a footnote the same great truth south sea hath proved on that famed theatre the alley where thousands by directors moved are no sad monuments of folly what momus was of old to jove the same harlequin is now the former was buffoon above the latter is a punch below this fleeting scene is but a stage where various images appear in different parts of youth and age alike the prince and peasant share some draw our eyes by being great false pomp conceals mere wood within and legislators reign in state are off but wisdom is machine a stock may chance to wear a crown and timber as a lord take place a statue may put on a frown and cheat us with a thinking face others are blindly led away and made to act for ends unknown but the mere spring of wires their play and speak in language not their own too oft alas a scolding wife aspers a jollo felly's throne and many drink the cup of life mixed and embittered by a joan in short whatever men pursue of pleasure folly war or love 
this mimic race brings all to view alike they dress they talk they move go on great stretch with artful hand mortals to please and to deride and when death breaks thy vital band thou shalt put on a puppet's pride thou shalt in puny wood be shown thy image shall preserve thy fame ages to come thy worth shall own point at thy limbs and tell thy name tell time he draws a fierce in vain before he looks in nature's glass puns cannot form a witty scene nor pedantry for humour pass to make men act as senseless would and chatter in a mystic strain is a mere force on flesh and blood and shows some error in the brain he that would thus refine on thee and turn thy stage into a school the just of punch will ever be and stand confessed the greater fool End of section nine read by Elijah fisher section ten of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift section ten candenis and vanessa written in o seventeen thirteen the shepherds and the nymphs were seen pleading before the superior queen the council for the fair began accusing the false creature man the brief was weighty crimes was charged on which the pleader much enlarged that cupid now has lost his art or blunts the point of every dart his altar now no longer smokes his mother's aid no youth invokes this tempts free thinkers to refine and bring in doubt their powers divine now love is dwindled to intrigue and marriage grown a money league which crimes aforesaid with her leave were as he humbly did conceive against our sovereign lady's peace against the statues in that case against her dignity and her crown then prayed in answer and sat down the nymphs were scorn beheld their foes when the defendant's counsel arose and what no liar ever lacked with impudence owned all the fact but what the gentlest heart would vex laid all the fault on the other sex that modern love is no such thing as what those ancient poets sing a fire celestial chase refined conceived and kindled in the mind which having found an equal flame unites and both become the same in different breasts together burn together both to ashes turn but women now feel no such fire and only know the gross desire their passions move in lower spheres where caprice or folly steers a dog a parrot or an ape or some worse brute in human shape engross the fancies of the fair the few soft moments they can spare from visits to receive and pay from scandal politics and play from fans and flounces and brocades from equipage and park parades from all the thousand female toys from every trifle that employs the out or insight of their heads between their toilets and their beds in a dull stream which moving slow you hardly see the current flow if a small breeze obstructs the course it rolls about for want of force and in its narrow circle gathers nothing but chaff and straws and feathers the current of a female mind stopped thus and turns with every wind thus whirling round gather draws fools fops and rakes for chaff and straws here we conclude no woman's hearts are won by virtue wit and parts nor are the men of sense to blame for breasts incapable of flame the fault on the nymphs be placed grown so corrupted in their taste the pleader having spoke his best had witness ready to attest 
who fairly could an oath depose when questions on the fact arose that every article was true nor further those despondents knew therefore he humbly would insist the bill might be with costs dismissed the cause appeared of so much weight that venus from the judgment seat desired them not to talk so loud else she must interpose a cloud for if the heavenly folk should know these pleadings in the courts below that morals here disdain to love she ne'er could show her face above for gods their betters are too wise to value that men despise and then said she my son and i must stroll an air twixt earth and sky or else shut out from heaven and earth fly to the sea my place of birth there lived with dangled mermaids pent and keep on fish perpetual lent but since the case appeared so nice she thought it best to take advice the muses by their king's permission though foes to love attend the session on the right hand took their places in order on the left the graces to whom she might her dobes propose on all emergencies that rose the muses oft were seen to frown the graces half ashamed looked down and twas observed there were but few of either sex among the crew whom she or her assistners knew the goddess soon began to see things were not ripe for a decree and said she must consult her books the lovers flatas bractons cokes first to a dapper clerk she beckoned to turn to ovid book the second she then referred them to a place in virgil by dido's case as for tibullus's reports they never passed for law in courts for cowley's brief and pleas of waller still their authority is smaller there was on both sides much to say she'd hear the cause another day and so she did and then a third she heard it there she kept her word but with rejoinders and replies long bills and answers stuffed with lies demur in parlance and a soin the parties near could issue join for sixteen years the cause was spun and then stood where it first begun now gentle silo sing or say what venus meant by this delay the goddess much perplexed in mind to see her empire thus declined was first this grand debate arose above her wisdom to compose conceived a project in her head to work her ends which if it sped would show the merits of the cause for better than consulting laws in a glad hour lucina's aid produced on earth a wondrous maid on whom the queen of love was bent to try a new experiment she threw her law-books on the shelf and thus debated with herself since man allege they ne'er can find those beauties in a female mind which raise a flame that will endure for ever uncorrupt and pure it tis with reason they complain this infant shall restore my reign i'll search where every virtue dwells from courts inclusive down to cells what preachers talk or sages write these i will gather and unite and represent them to mankind collected in that infant's mind this said she plucks in heaven's high bowers a spring of amerithenian flowers in nectar thrice infuses bays three times refined in titan's rays then calls the graces to her aid and sprinkles thrice the now-born maid from whence the tender skin assumes a sweetness above all perfumes from whence a cleanliness remains incapable of outward stains from whence that decency of mind so lovely in a female kind where not one careless thought intrudes less modest than with the speech of prudes where never blush was called an aid the spurious virtue in a maid a virtue but at second hand 
they blush because they understand the graces next would act their part and show but little of their art their work was half already done the child with native beauty shone the outward from no help required each breathing on her thrice inspired that gentle soft engaging air which in old times adorned the fair and said vanessa be the name by which thou shalt be known to fame vanessa by the gods enrolled her name on earth shall not be told but still the work was not complete when venus thought on a deceit drawn by her doves away she flies and finds out pallas in the skies dear pallas i have been this morn a to see a lovely infant born a boy in yonder isle below so like my own without his bow by beauty could your heart be won you'd swear it is apollo's son but it shall ne'er be said a child so hopeful has by me been spoiled i have enough besides to spare and give him wholly to your care wisdom's above suspecting files the queen of learning gravely smiles down from olympus comes with joy mistakes vanessa for a boy then sows within her tender mind seeds long unknown to womankind for manly bosoms chiefly fit the seeds of knowledge judgment wit her soul was suddenly endued with justice truth and fortitude with honour which no breath can stain which malice must attack in vain with open heart and bounteous hand but pallas here was at a stand she knew in our degenerate days but her virtue could not live on praise that meat must be with money bought she therefore upon second thought infused yet as it were by stealth some small regard for state and wealth of which she grew up there stayed a tincture in the prudent maid she managed her estate with care yet liked three footmen to her chair but lest he should neglect his studies like a young hare the thrifty goddess for fear young master should be spoiled used him like a younger child and after long computing found twould come to just five thousand pound the queen of love was pleased and proud to we vanessa thus endowed she doubted not but such a dame through every breast would dart a flame that every rich and lordly swain with pride would drag about her chain that scholars would forsake their books to study bright vanessa's looks as she advanced that womankind would by her model form their mind and all their conduct would be tried by her as an unerring guide offending daughters oft would hear vanessa's praise rung in the ear miss betty when she does a fault lets fall her knife or spills the salt will thus be by her mother chid tis what vanessa never did thus by the nymphs and swains adored my power shall be again restored and happy lovers bless my reign so venus hoped but hoped in vain for when in time the martial maid found out the trick that venus played she shakes her helm she knits her brows and fired with indignation vows to-morrow ere the setting sun she'd all undo that she had done but in the poets we may find a wholesome law time out of mind had been confirmed by fate's degree that gods of whatsoe'er degree resume not what themselves have given or any brother god in heaven which keeps the peace among the gods or they must always be at odds and pallas if she broke the laws must yield her foe the stronger cause a shame to one so much adored for wisdom at jove's council board besides she feared the queen of love would meet with better friends above and though she must with grief reflect 
to see a mortal virgin decked with graces hitherto unknown to female breasts except her own yet she would act as best became a goddess of unspotted fame she knew by augury divine venus would fail in her design she studied well the point and found her foe's conclusions were not sound but premises erroneous brought and therefore the deductions not and must have contrary effects to what her treacherous foe expects in proper season pallas meets the queen of love whom thus she greets for gods we are by homer told can in celestial language scold perfidious goddess but in vain you formed this project in your brain a project for thy talents fit with much deceit and little wit thou hast as thou shalt quickly see deceived thyself instead of me for how can heavenly wisdom prove an instrument to earthly love knowest thou not yet that men commence thy votaries for want of sense nor shall vanessa be the theme to manage thy abortive scheme she'll prove the greatest of thy foes and yet i scorn to interpose by using neither skill nor force leave all things to their natural course the goddess thus pronounced her doom when lo vanessa in her bloom advanced like atlanta star but rarely seen and seen from far in a new world with caution stepped watched all the company she kept well knowing from the book she read what dangerous paths young virgins thread would seldom at the park appear nor saw the playhouse twice a year yet not incurious was inclined to know the converse of mankind first issued from perfumers shops a crowd of fashionable fops they liked her how she liked the play then told the tattle of the day a duel fought last night at two about a lady you know who mentioned a new italian come either from muscovy or rome give hints of who and who's together then fell to talking of the weather last night was so extremely fine the ladies walked till after nine then in soft voice and speech absurd with nonsense every second word with fustian from exploding plays they celebrate her beauty's praise run o'er their cant of stupid lies and tell the murders of her eyes with silent scorn vanessa sat scarce listening to their idle chat further than sometimes by a frown when they grew parked to pull them down at last she spitefully was bent to try their wisdom's full extent and said she valued nothing less than titles figure shape and dress that marriage should be chiefly placed in judgment knowledge wit and taste and these she offered to dispute alone distinguished man from brute that present times have no pretence to virtue in the noble sense by greeks and romans understood to perish for our country's good she named the ancient heroes round explained for what they were renowned then spoke with censure or applause of foreign customs rights and laws through nature and through art she ranged and gracefully her subject changed in vain her hearers had no share in all she spoke except to stare their judgment was upon the whole that lady is the dullest so then tipped their forehead in a jeer as who should say she wants it here she may be handsome young and rich but none will burn her for a witch a party next of glittering dames from round the perlius of st james came early out of pure good will to see the girl in dishabille their clamour lighting from their chairs it grew louder all the way upstairs at the entrance loudest where they found the room with volumes littered round vanessa held montague and read whilst miss susan combed her head they called for tea and chocolate and fell into their usual chat discoursing with important face on ribbons fans and gloves and lace 
showed patterns just from india brought and gravely asked her what she thought whether the red or green were best and what they cost vanessa guessed as came into her fancy first named half the rates and liked the worst the scandal next what awkward thing was that last sunday in the ring i'm sorry mops a break so fast i said her face would never last corinna with that youthful air is thirty and a bit to spare your fondness for a certain earl began when i was but a girl phyllis who but a month ago was married to the turnbridge pio i saw quitting rather night in public with that odious knight they railed next vanessa's dress that gown was made for old queen bess dear madam let me see your head don't you intend to put on red a petticoat without a hoop sure you are not ashamed to stoop with handsome garrets at your knees no matter what a fellow sees filled with disdain with rage and flame both of herself and sex ashamed the nymph stood silent out of spite nor would vouchsafe to set them right away the fair detractors went and gave by turns their censures vent she's not so handsome in my eyes for wit i wonder where it lies she's fair and clean and that's the most but why proclaim her for a toast a baby face no life no airs but what she learnt in country fairs scarce knows what difference is between rich flanders lace and colbertine i'll undertake my little nancy if flounces has a better fancy with all her wit i would not ask her judgment how to buy a mask we begged her but to patch her face she never hit one proper place which every girl at five years old can do as soon as she is told i own that out of fashion stuff becomes the creature well enough the girl might pass if we could get her to know the world a little better to know the world a modern phrase for visits ombre balls and plays thus to the world's perpetual shame the queen of beauty lost her aim too late with grief she understood pallas had done more harm than good for examples are but vain where ignorance begets disdain both sexes armed with guilt and spite against vanessa's power unite to copy her few nymphs aspired her virtues fewer swains admired so stars beyond a certain height give mortals neither height nor light yet some of the other sex endowed with gifts superior to the crowd with virtue knowledge taste and wit she condensed to admit with pleasing art she could reduce men's talents to their proper use and with the dress each genius hold to that wherein it most excelled thus making others wisdom known could please them and improve her own a modest youth said something new she placed it in the strongest view all humble worth she strove to raise would not be praised yet loved to praise they learned met with free approach although they came not in a coach some clergy too she would allow nor quarrelled at their awkward bow for this was candenus's sake a gownman of a different make whom pallas once vanessa's tutor had fixed on for her caducutor but cupid full of mischief longs to vindicate his mother's wrongs on pallas all attempts are vain one way he knows to give her pain vows on vanessa's heart to take due vengeance for her patron's sake those early seeds by venus shown in spite of pallas now were grown and cupid hoped they would improve by time and ripen into love the boy made use of all his craft in vain discharging many a shaft pointed at colonials lords and beaux candenus worded off the blows for placing still some book betwixt the darts were in the cover fixed or 
often blunted and recoiled and plutarch's moral struck were spoiled the queen of wisdom could foresee but not prevent the fate's decree and human caution tries in vain to break that adamantine chain vanessa though by palace taught by love and vulnerable thought searching in books for wisdom's aid was in the very search betrayed cupid though all his darts were lost yet still resolved to spare no cost he could not answer to his fame the triumphs of that stubborn dame a nymph so hard to be subdued who neither was coquette nor prude i find says he she wants a doctor both to adore her and instruct her i'll give her what she most admires among these venerable sires Candenus is a subject fit grown old in politics and wit caressed by ministers of state of half mankind the dread and hate whatever vexations love attend she need no rivals apprehend her sex with universal voice must laugh at her capricious choice Candenus many things had writ vanessa much esteemed his wit and called for his poetic works meantime the boy in secret lurks and while the book was in her hand the urchin from his private stand took aim and shot with all his strength a dart of such prodigious length it pierced the feeble volume through and deep transfixed her bosom too some lines more moving than the rest struck to the point that pierced her breast and borne directly to the heart with pains unknown increased her smart vanessa not in years a score dreams of a gown of forty-four imaginary charms can find in eyes with reading almost blind condennis now no more appears declined in health advanced in years she fancies music in his tongue nor farther looks but thinks him young what mariner is not afraid to venture in a ship decayed what planter will attempt to yoke a sapling with a falling oak as years increase she brighter shines condennis on each day declines and he must fall a prey to time while she continues in her prime condennis common forms apart in every scene had kept his heart had sighed and languished vowed and writ for pastime or to show his wit but time and books and state affairs had spoiled his fashionable airs and now could praise esteem and prove but understood not what was love his conduct might have made him styled a father and the nymph his child that innocent delight he took to see the virgin mind her book was but the master's secret joy in school to hear the finest boy her knowledge with her fancy grew she hourly pressed for something new ideas came into her mind so fact his lessons lagged behind she reasoned without plodding long nor ever gave her judgment wrong but now a sudden change was wrought she minds no longer what he taught Candenus was amazed to find such marks of a distracted mind for though she seemed to listen more to all he spoke than e'er before he found her thoughts would absent rage yet guessed not whence could spring the change and first he modestly conjectures his pupil might be tired with lectures which helped to mortify his pride yet gave him not the heart to chide but in a mild dejected strain at last he ventured to complain said she would no longer be teased might have her freedom when she pleased was now convinced he acted wrong to hide her from the world so long and in dull studies to engage one of her tender sex and age that every nymph was envy owned how she might shine in the grandy mound and every shepherd was undone to see her cloistered like a nun this was a visionary scheme he walked and found it but a dream a project far above his skill for nature must be nature still if she was bolder than became a scholar to a courtly dame she might excuse a man of letters thus tutors often treat their betters and since his talk offensive grew he came to take his last adieu 
Vanessa, filled with just disdain, would still her dignity maintain, instructed from her early years to scorn the art of female tears. Had he employed his time so long to teach her what was right or wrong, yet could such notions entertain that all his lectures were in vain? She owed the wanderings of her thoughts, but she must answer for her faults. She well remembered to her cost that all his lessons were not lost. Two maxims she could still produce, and said experience taught her use. That virtue, pleased by being shown, knows nothing which it dare not own, can make us without fear disclose our inmost secrets to our foes, that common forms were not designed, directors to a noble mind. Now, said the nymph, I'll let you see, my actions with your rules agree, that I can vulgar forms despise, and have no secrets to disguise. I knew by what you said and writ how dangerous things were men of wit. You cautioned me against their charms, but never gave me equal arms. Your lessons found the weakest part, aimed at the head, but reached the heart. Condenis felt within him rise, shame, disappointment, guilt, surprise. He know not how to reconcile such language with her usual style, and yet her words were so expressed he could not hope she spoke in jest. His thoughts had wholly been confined to form and cultivate her mind. He hardly knew till he was told whether the nymph were young or old, had met her in a public place without distinguishing her face. Much less could his declining age Vanessa's earliest thoughts engage, and if her youth and difference met, his person must contempt beget, or grant her passion be sincere, how shall his innocence be clear? Appearances were all so strong, the world must think him in the wrong, would say if he made a treacherous use of wit to flatter and seduce. The town would swear he had betrayed by magic spells the harmless maid, and every beau would have his jokes, that scholars were like other folks, that when platonic flights were over, the tutor turned a mortal lover, so tender of the young and fair, that showed a true paternal care. Five thousand guineas in her purse, the doctor might have fancied worse. Hardly at length he silenced, broke, and flattered every word he spoke, interpreting her complacence, just as a man sans consequence. She rallied well, he always knew her manner now was something new and what she spoke was in an air as serious as a tragic player but those who aim at ridicule should fix upon some certain rule which fairly hints they are in jest else he must enter his protest for let a man be ne'er so wise he might be caught with sober lies a science which he never taught and to be free was dearly bought for take it in its proper light tis just what coxcombs call a bite but not to dwell on things minute vanessa finished the dispute brought weighty arguments to prove that reason was her guide in love she thought he had himself described his doctrines when she fist embittered what he had planted now was grown his virtues she might call her own as he approves as he dislikes love or contempt her fancy strikes self-love in nature rooted fast attends us first and leaves us last why she likes him admire not at her she loves herself and that's the matter how was her tutor wont to praise the geniuses of ancient days those authors he so oft had named for learning wit and wisdom famed was struck with love, esteem, and awe for persons whom he never saw. Suppose Candenus flourished then, he must adore such godlike men. If one short volume could comprise all that was witty, learned, and wise, how would it be esteemed and read, although the writer long were dead? If such an author were alive, how all would for his friendship strive, and come in crowds to see his face? and this she takes to be her case condenis answers every end the book the author and the friend the utmost her desires will reach is but to learn what he can teach his converse 
is a system fit alone to fill up all her wit while every passion of her mind in him is censured and confined love can with speech inspire a mute and taught vanessa to dispute this topic never touched before displayed her eloquence the more her knowledge with such pains acquired but this new passion grew inspired through this she made all objects pass which gave a tincture o'er the mass as rivers though they bend and twine still to the sea their course incline or as philosophers who find some favourite system to their mind in every point to make it fit will force all nature to submit can dennis who could ne'er suspect his lessons would have such effect or be so artfully applied insensibly came on her side it was unforeseen event things took a turn he never meant war exiles in what we prize appears a hero to our eyes each girl is pleased with what is taught will have the teacher in her thought when miss delights in her spinet a filder may a fortune get a blockhead with melody's voice in boarding schools can have his choice and oft the dancing master's art climbs from the toe to touch the heart in learning yet a nip delight the pendant gets a mistress bite can dennis to his grief and shame could scarce oppose vanessa's flame but thought her arguments were strong at least could hardly with them wrong however it came he could not tell but sure she never talked so well his pride began to interpose preferred before a crowd of beaux so bright a nymph to come unsought such wonder by his merit wrought tis merit must with her prevail he never know his judgment fail she noted all she ever read and had a most discerning head tis an old maxim in the schools that vanity's the food of fools yet now and then your men of wit will condensed to take a bit so when condennis could not hide he chose to justify his pride contruing the passion she had shown much to her praise more to his own nature in him had merit placed in her a most judicious taste love hitherto a transient guest ne'er held possession in his breast so long attending at the gate disdained to enter in so late love why do we one passion call when tis a compound of them all were hot and cold were sharp and sweet and all their equipages meet where pleasures mixed with pains appear sorrow with joy and hope with fear wherein his dignity and age forbid condennis to engage but friendship in its greatest height and a constant rational delight on virtue's basis fixed to last when love's allurements long are past which gently warms but cannot burn it gladly offers in return his want of passion will redeem with gratitude respect esteem with that devotion we bestow when goddesses appear below while thus can dennis entertains vanessa in exalted strains the nymph in sober words entreats a truce with all sublime conceits for why such raptures flights and fancies to her who durst not read romances in lovely style to make replies which he had taught her to despise but when her tutor will affect devotion duty and respect he fairly abdicates his throne the government is now her own he has a forfeiture incurred she vows to take him at his word and hopes he will not take it strange if both should now their stations change the nymph will have her turn to be the tutor and the pupil he though she already can discern his scholar is not apt to learn or wants capacity to reach the silence she designs to teach wherein his genius was below the skill of every common beau who though he cannot spell is wise enough to read a lady's eyes and will each accidental glance interpret for a kind advance but what successes vanessa met is to the world a secret yet whether the nymph to please her swain talks in a high romantic strain or whether he at last descends 
to like with less seraphic ends or to compound the business whether they temper love and books together it must never to mankind be told nor shall the conscience muse unfold meantime the mournful queen of love led but a weary life above she ventures now to leave the skies drawn by vanessa's conduct wise for though by one preserve event palace had crossed her first intent though her design was not obtained yet she much experience gained and by the project vainly tried could better now the cause decide she gave due notice that both parties caram regina proximertis should at their peril without fail come and appear and save their bail all met and silence thrice proclaimed one lawyer to each side was named the judge discovered in her face resentments for her late disgrace and full of anger shame and grief directed them to mind their brief nor spend their time to show their reading she'd have a summary proceeding she gathered under every head the sum of what each lawyer said gave her own reasons last and then decreed the cause against the men but in a weighty case like this to show she did not judge amiss which evil tongues might else report she made a speech in open court wherein she grievously complains how she was cheated by the swains on whose petition humbly showing that women were not worth the wooing and that unless the sex would mend the race of lovers soon must end she was at lord knows what expense to form a nymph of wit and sense a model for her sex designed who never could one lover find she saw her favour was misplaced the fellows had a richer taste she needs must tell them to their face they were a senseless stupid race and were she to begin again she'd study to reform the men or add some grains of folly more to women than they had before to put them on equal foot and this or nothing else would do it this might their mutual fancy strike since every being loves its like but now repenting what was done she left all business to her son she puts the world in his possession and let him use it at direction the crier was adorned to dismiss the court so made his last oh yes the goddess would no longer wait but rising from her chair of state left all below at six and seven harnessed her doves and flew to heaven end of section ten read by elijah fisher section eleven of the battle of the books this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section 11. Stella's Birthday, 1718. Stella this day is thirty-four. We shan't dispute a year or more. However, Stella, be not troubled, although thy size and years are doubled. Since first I saw thee at sixteen, the brightest virgin on the green, so little is thy form declined made up so largely in thy mind oh would it please the gods to split thy beauty size and years and wit no age could furnish out a pair of nymphs so graceful wise and fair with half the lustre of pure eyes with half your wit your years and size and then before it grew too late how should i beg of gentle fate that neither nymph might lack her swain to split my worship too in twain end of section eleven read by elijah fisher section twelve of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift Section 12. Stella's Birthday, 1720. All travellers at first incline, where they see the fairest sign, and if they find the chambers neat, and like the liquor and the meat, will call again and recommend the angel in to every friend. What though the painting grows decayed, the house 
will never lose its trade nay though the treacherous tapster thomas hangs a new angel to doors from us as fine as dauber's hands can make it in hopes that strangers may mistake it we think it both a shame and sin to quit the true old angel in now this is stella's case in fact an angel's face a little cracked could poets or could painters fix how angels look at thirty-six this drew us in at first to find in such a form an angel's mind and every virtue now supplies the fainting rays of stella's eyes see at her levy crowding swains whom stella freely entertains with breeding humour wit and sense and puts them but to small expense their mind so plentifully fills and makes such reasonable bills so little gets for what she gives we really wonder how she lives and had her stock been less no doubt she must have long ago run out then who can think will quit the place when dole hangs out a newer face or stop and light at chloe's hand with scraps and leavings to be fed then chloe still go on to prate of thirty-six and thirty-eight pursue your trade of scandal picking your hints that stella is no chicken your nindos when you tell us that stella loves to talk with fellows and let me warn you to believe a truth for which your soul should grieve that should you live to see the day when stella's locks must all be grey when age must print a furrowed trace on every feature of her face though you and all your senseless tribe could art or time or nature bribe to make you look like beauty's queen and hold for ever at fifteen no bloom of youth can ever blind the cracks and wrinkles of your mind all men of sense will pass your door and crowd to stella's at for score end of section twelve read by elijah fisher section thirteen of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift section thirteen stella's birthday a great bottle of wine long buried being that day dug up seventeen twenty two resolved my annual verse to pay by duty bound on stella's day furnished with papers pens and ink i gravely sat me down to think i bit my nails and scratched my head but found my wit and fancy fled or if with more than usual pain a thought came slowly from my brain it cost me lord knows how much time to shape it into sense and rhyme and what was yet a greater curse long thinking made my fancy worse forsaken by the inspiring nine i waited at apollo's shrine i told him what the world would say if stella were unsung to-day how should i hide my head for shame when both the jacks and robin came how ford would frown how jim would leer how s h r the rogue would sneer and swear it does not always follow that smellens anno ridit apollo i have assured them twenty times that phobus helped me in my rhymes phobus inspired me from above and he and i were hand in glove but finding me so dull and dry since they'll call it all poetic license and when i brag of aid divine think euston's right as good as mine nor do i ask for stella's sake tis my own credit lies at stake and stella will be sung while i can only be a stander-by apollo having thought a little returned this answer to a tittle though you should live like old methuselah i furnish hints and you should use solemn you yearly sing as she grows old you'd leave her virtues half untold but to say truth such dullness reigns through the whole set of irish deans i'm daily stunned with such a medley dean 
W, Dean D I, and Dean S. That let what Dean soever come. My orders are, I'm not at home, and if your voice had not been loud, you must have passed among the crowd. But now your danger to prevent, you must apply to Mrs. Bent, a footnote, a housekeeper, end of footnote, for she, as priestess, knows the rites, wherein the god of earth delights, first nine ways looking, let her stand, with an old poker in her hand, let her describe a circle round in saunders, footnote the butler, end of footnote, cellar on the ground, a spade let prudent Archie, a footnote, the footman, hold, end of footnote, and with discretion dig the mould, let Stella look with watchful eye, Rebecca, Ford, and Grattan's by, behold the bottle where it lies, with neck elated towards the skies, the god of winds and god of fire, did to its wondrous birth conspire, and Bacchus, for the poet's use, poured in a strong inspiring juice. See, as you raise it from its tomb, it drinks behind a spacious womb, and in the spacious womb contains a sovereign medicine for the brains. You'll find it soon, if faith consents, if not a thousand Mrs. Bents, ten thousand Archies armed with spades, may dig in vain to Pluto's shades, from thence a plenteous draught infuse, and boldly then invoke the muse but first let robert on his knees with caution drain it from the lees the muse will at your call appear with stella's praise to crown the year end of section thirteen read by elijah fisher section fourteen of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section 14 Stella's Birthday, 1724 As when a beauteous nymph decays, we say she's past her dancing days. So poets lose their feet by time, and can no longer dance in rhyme. Your annual bard had rather chose to celebrate your birth in prose, yet merry folks who want by chance a pair to make a country dance call the old housekeeper and get her to fill a place for want of better while sheridan is off the hooks and friend delaney at his books that stella may avoid disgrace once more the dean supplies their place beauty and wit too sad a truth have always been confined to youth the god of wit and beauty's queen he twenty-one and she fifteen no poet ever sweetly sung unless he were like phobus young nor ever nymph inspired to rhyme unless like venus in her prime at fifty-six if this be true am i a poet fit for you or the age of forty-three are you a subject fit for me adieu bright wit and radiant eyes you must be grave and i be wise our fate in vain we would oppose but i'll be still your friend in prose esteem and friendship to express will not require poetic dress and if the muse deny her aid to have them sung they may be said but stella say what evil tongue reports you are no longer young that time sits with its scythe too low where erst sat cupid with his bow that half your locks are turned to grey i'll ne'er believe a word they say tis true but let it not be known my eyes are somewhat diminished and grown for nature always in the right to your decays adapts my sight and wrinkles undistinguished pass for i am ashamed to use a glass and till i see them with these eyes whoever says you have them lies no length of time can make you quit honour and virtue sense and wit thus you may still be young to me while i can better hear them see or ne'er may fortune show her spite to make me deaf and mend my sight. End of section fourteen. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section fifteen of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
the battle of the books and other short pieces by jonathan swift section fifteen stella's birthday march thirteenth seventeen twenty six this day whatever the fates decree shall be kept with joy by me this day then let us not be told that you are sick and i grown old nor think on our approaching ills and talk of spectacles and pills to-morrow will be time enough to hear such mortifying stuff yet since from reason may be brought a better and more pleasing thought which can in spite of all decays support a few remaining days from not the gravest of divines except for one of some serious lines although we can now form no more long schemes of life as heretofore yet you while time is running fast can look with joy on what is past with future happiness and pain a mere contrivance of the brain as atheists argue to entice and fit their proselytes for vice the only comfort they propose to have companions in their woes grant this the case yet sure tis hard that virtue styled its own reward and by all sages understood to be the chief of human good should acting die or leave behind some lasting pleasure in the mind which by remembrance will assuage grief sickness poverty and age and strongly shoot a radiant dart to shine through life's declining part say stella feel you no content reflecting on a life well spent your skilful hand employed to save despairing wretches from the grave and then supporting with your store those whom you dragged from death before so providence on mortals waits preserving what it first creates your generous boldness to defend an innocent and absent friend that courage which can make you just to merit humbled in the dust the detestation you express for vice in all its glittering dress that patience under to torturing pain where stubborn stoics would complain must these like empty shadows pass or forms reflected from a glass or mere chimeras in the mind that fly and leave no marks behind does not the body thrive and grow by food of twenty years ago and had it not been still supplied it must a thousand times have died then who with reason can maintain that no effects of food remain and is not virtue in mankind the nutriment that feeds the mind upheld by each good action past and still continued by the last then who with reason can pretend that all effects of virtue end believe me stella when you show the true contempt for things below nor prize your life from other ends that merely to oblige your friends your former actions claim their part and join to fortify your heart for virtue in her daily race like janus bears a double face look back with joy where she has gone and therefore goes with courage on she at your sickly couch will wait and guide you to a better state oh then whatever heaven intends take pity on your pitying friends nor let your ills affect your mind to fancy they can be unkind me surely me you ought to spare who gladly would your sufferings share or give my scrap of life to you and think it far beneath your due you to whose care so oft i owe that i am alive to tell you so End of section 15. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 16 of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section 16. To Stella. Visiting me in my sickness, October 1727. Alas, observing Stella's wit, was more than for her sex was fit, and that her beauty, soon or late, might breed confusion in the state, in high concern for humankind, fixed honour in her infant mind, but not in wranglings to engage, with such a stupid vicious age, if honour I would here define, 
if answers faith in things divine as natural life the body warms in schools teach the soul and forms so honour animates the whole and is the spirit of the soul those numerous virtues which the tribe of tedious mortalists describe and by such various titles call true honour comprehends them all let melancholy rule supreme choler preside or blood or filgum it makes no difference in the case nor is complexion honour's place but lest we should for honours take the drunken quarrels of a rake or think it seated in a scar or on a proud triumphal car or in the payment of a debt we lose the sharpers at piquet or when a whore in her vocation keeps punctual to assassination or that on which his lordship swears when vulgar knaves would lose their ears let stella's for example preach a lesson she alone can teach in points of honour to be tried all passions must be laid aside ask no advice but think alone suppose the question not your own how shall i act is not the case but how would brutus in my place in such a case would catchel bleed how would socrates proceed drive all objections from your mind else you relapse to humankind ambition avarice and lust and facious rage and breach of trust and flattery tipped with nauseous fear and guilt and shame and servile fear envy and cruelty and pride will in your tainted heart preside heroes and heroines of old by honour only were enrolled among their brethren in the skies to which though late stella shall rise ten thousand oaths upon record are not sacred as her word the world shall in its atoms end ere stella can deceive a friend by honour seated in her breast she still determines what is best with indignation in her mind against enslavers of mankind base kings and ministers of state eternal objects of her hate she thinks that nature near designed courage to man alone confined can cowardice her sex adorn which most exposes ours to scorn she wonders where the charm appears in floor rimal's affected fears for stella never learned the art at proper times to scream and start nor calls up the house at night and swears she saw a thing in white dole never flies to cut her lace or throw cold water in her face because she heard a sudden drum or found an earwig in a plum her hearers are amazed from whence proceeds that fund of wit and sense which though her modesty would shroud breaks like the sun behind a cloud while gracefulness in art conceals and yet through every notion steals say stella what prometheus blind informing you mistook your kind no twas for you alone he stole the fire that forms a manly soul then to complete it every way he moulded it with female clay to that you owe the nobler fame to this the beauty of your frame how would ingratitude delight and how would censure glut her spite if i should stella's kindness hide and silence or forget with pride when on my sickly cough I lay, impatient both of night and day, lamenting in unmanly strains, called every power to ease my pains. Then Stella ran to my relief, with cheerful face and inward grief, and though by heaven's severe decree she suffers hourly more than me, no cruel master could require from slaves employed for daily hire what Stella by her friendship warmed, with vigor and delight performed my sinking spirits now supplies with cordials in her hands and eyes now with a soft and silent tread unheard she moves about my bed i see her taste each nauseous draught and so obligently and caught i bless the hand from whence they came nor dare distort my face for shame best pattern of true friendship beware you pay too dearly for your care if while your tenderness secures my life it must endanger yours for such a fool was never found who pulled a palace to the ground only to have the ruins made materials for a house decayed
while dr swift was at sir william temple's after he left the university of dublin he contracted a friendship with two of sir william's relations mrs johnson and mrs dingley which continued to their deaths the former of these was the amiable stella so much celebrated in his works in the year seventeen twenty seven being in england he received the melancholy news of her last sickness mrs dingley having been dead before he hastened into ireland where he visited her not only as a friend but a clergyman no set form of prayer could express the sense of his heart on that occasion he drew up the following here printed from his own handwriting she died january twenty eighth seventeen twenty seven End of section sixteen. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section seventeen of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section seventeen. The first he wrote October seventeenth, seventeen twenty seven most merciful father accept our humblest prayers in behalf of this thy languishing servant forgive the sins the frailties and infirmities of her life past accept the good deeds she hath done in such a manner that at whatever time thou shalt please to call her she may be received into everlasting habitations give her grace to continue sincerely thankful to thee for the many favors thou hast bestowed upon her for the ability and inclination and practice to do good and those virtues which have procured the esteem and love of her friends and a most unspotted name in the world o god thou dispensest thy blessings and thy punishments as it becometh infinite justice and mercy and since it was thy pleasure to afflict her with a long, constant, weakly state of health, make her truly sensible that it was for very wise ends, and was largely made up to her in other blessings, more valuable and less common. Continue to her, O Lord, that firmness and constancy of mind wherewith thou hast most graciously endowed her, together with that contempt of worldly things and vanities that she hath shown in the whole conduct of her life. O oh, all-powerful being, the least motion of whose will can create or destroy a world, pity us, the mournful friends of thy distressed servant, who sink under the weight of her present condition, and the fear of losing the most valuable of our friends. Restore her to us, O oh Lord, if it be thy gracious will, or inspire us with constancy and resignation to support ourselves under so heavy an affliction. Restore her, O Lord, for the sake of those poor, who, by losing her, will be desolate, and those sick, who will not only want her bounty, but her care and tending, or else, in thy mercy, raise up some other in her place with equal disposition and better abilities lessen o lord we beseech thee her bodily pains or give her a double strength of mind to support them and if thou wilt soon take her to thyself turn our thoughts rather upon that felicity which we hope she shall enjoy that upon that unspeakable loss we shall endure let her memory be ever dear unto us, and the example of her many virtues, as far as human infirmity will admit, our constant invitation. Accept, O Lord, these prayers poured from the very bottom of our hearts, in thy mercy, and for the merits of our blessed Saviour. Amen. End of section 17. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 18 of The Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section 18 The Second Prayer Was Written November 6, 1727 O merciful Father, who never afflictest thy children, but for their own good, and with justice, over which thy mercy always prevaileth, either to turn them to repentance, or to punish them in the present life, in order to reward them in a better, take pity, we beseech thee, upon this thy poor afflicted servant, languishing so long and so grievously under the weight of thy hand. Give her strength, O Lord, to support her weakness, and patience to endure her pains, without repining. Forgive every rash and inconsiderate expression which her anguish may at a time force from her tongue, while her heart continueth in an entire submission to thy will. Suppress in her, O Lord, all eager desires of life, and lessen her fears of death, by inspiring into her an humble yet assured hope of thy mercy. Give her a sincere repentance for all her transgressions and omissions, and a firm resolution to pass the remainder of her life in endeavouring to her utmost to observe all thy precepts. We beseech thee, likewise, to compose her thoughts, and preserve to her the use of her memory, and reason during the course of her sickness. Give her a true conception of the vanity, folly, and insignificancy of all human things, and strengthen her so as to beget in her a sincere love of thee in the midst of her sufferings. Accept and impute all her good deeds, and forgive her all those offences against thee, which she hath sincerely repented of, or through the frailty of memory hath forgot. And now, O Lord, we turn to thee in behalf of ourselves and the rest of her sorrowful friends. Let not our grief afflict her mind, and thereby have an ill effect on her present distemper. Forgive the sorrow and weakness of those among us who sink under the grief and terror of losing so dear and useful a friend. Accept and pardon our most earnest prayers and wishes for her long continuance in this evil world, to do what thou art pleased to call thy service, and is only her bounden duty that she may be still a comfort to us, and to all others, who will want the benefit of her conversation, her advice, her good offices, or her charity. And since thou hast promised that there were two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt be in the midst of them to grant their request. O gracious Lord, grant to us who are here met in thy name, that those requests which, in the utmost sincerity and earnestness of our hearts, we have now made in behalf of this thy distressed servant and of ourselves may effectually be answered through the merits of jesus christ our lord amen end of section eighteen read by elijah fisher section nineteen of the battle of the books this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section 19 The Beast's Confession, 1732 When beasts could speak, the learned say, they still can do so every day. It seems they had religion then, as much as now we find in men. It happened when a plague broke out which therefore made them more devout. The king of brutes, to make it plain, of quadrupeds I only mean, by a proclamation gave command that every subject in the land should to the priest confess their sins. And thus the pious wolf begins, Good father, I must own with shame that often I have been to blame. I must confess on Friday last, Wretch that I was, 
I broke my fast. But I defied the set tongue to prove I did my neighbor wrong, or ever went to seek my food by rapine, theft, or thirst of blood. The ass approaching next confessed that in his heart he loved a jest. A wag he was, he needs must own, and could not let a dunce alone. Sometimes his friend he would not spare, and might perhaps be too severe. But yet the worst that could be said, he was a wit both born and bred. And if it be a sin or shame, nature alone must bear the blame. One fault he hath is sorry for it. His ears are half a foot too short, which could he to the standard bring. He'd show his face before the king. Then, for his voice, there's none disputes, that he's the nightingale of brutes. The swine, with contrite heart loud, his shape and beauty made him proud. In diet was perhaps too nice, but gluttony was ne'er his vice. In every turn of life content, and meekly took what fortune sent. Inquire through all the parish round, a better neighbor ne'er was found. His vigilance might seem displease. Tis true he hated sloth like peas. The mimic ape began his chatter, how evil tongues his life bespatter. Much of the constrained world complained, who said his gravity was feigned. Indeed, the strictness of his morals engaged him in a hundred quarrels. He saw, and he was grieved to see it, his zeal was sometimes indiscreet. He found his virtues too severe, for our corrupted times to bear. Yet such a lewd, licentious age might well excuse a stoic's rage. The goat advanced with decent pace, and first excused his youthful face. Forgiveness begged that he appeared, t'was nature's fault, without a beard. Tis true he was not much inclined to fondness for the female kind, not, as his enemies object, from chance or natural defect, not by his frigid constitution, but through a pious resolution. For he had made a holy vow, of chastity as monks do now, which he resolved to keep for ever hence, as strictly too as doth his reverence. A footnote, the priest his confessor, and a footnote. Apply the tale, and you shall find how just it suits with human kind. Some faults we own, but can you guess? Why? Virtues carried to excess, wherewith our vanity endows us though neither foe nor friend allows us. The lawyer swears, you may rely on it. He never squeezed a needy client, and this he makes his constant rule, for which his brethren call him fool. His conscience always was so nice. He freely gave the poor advice, by which he lost, he may affirm, a hundred fees last Easter term, while others of the learned robe would break the patience of a Job. No pleader at the bar could match his diligence and quick dispatch. Near kept a cause he well may boast, above a term or two at most. The cringing knave who seeks a place without success thus tells his case. Why should he longer mince the matter? He failed because he could not flatter. He had not learned to turn his coat nor for a party give his vote. His crime he quickly understood, too zealous for the nation's good. He found the ministers resent it, yet could not for his heart repent it. The chaplain vows he cannot fawn, though it would raise him to the lawn. He passed his hours among his books. You find it in his meager looks. He might, if he were worldly wise, preferment get and spare his eyes but owned he had a stubborn spirit that made him trust alone in merit would rise by merit to promotion alas a mere chimeric notion the doctor if you will believe him 
confessed a sin, and God forgive him. Called up at midnight, ran to save, a blind old beggar from the grave. But see how Satan spreads his snares. He quite forgot to say his prayers. He cannot help it, for his heart, sometimes to act the parson's part. Quotes from the Bible many a sentence, that moves his patience to repentance, and when his medicines do no good, supports their minds with heavenly food, at which, however, well intended, he hears the clergy are offended, and grown so bold behind his back to call him hypocrite and quack. In his own church he keeps a seat, says grace before and after meat, and calls without affecting airs, his household twice a day to prayers. He shuns apothecary shops, and hates to cram the sick with slops. He scorns to make his heart a trade, nor bribes my lady's favorite maid. Old nurse keepers would never hire to recommend him to the squire, which others, whom he will not name, have often practiced to their shame. The statesman tells you with a sneer, whose fault is to be too sincere, and having no sinister ends, is apt to disoblige his friends. The nation's good, his master's glory, without regard to Whig or Tory, were all the schemes he had in view, yet he was seconded by few. Though some had spread a thousand lies, t'was he defeated the excise. "'Twas known, though he had borne aspersion, "'that standing troops were his aversion. "'His practice was, in every station, "'to serve the king and please the nation, "'though hard to find in every case "'the fittest man to fill a place. "'His premises he ne'er forgot, "'but took memorials on the spot. "'His enemies, for want of charity, "'said he affected popularity.' "'Tis true, the people understood, that all he did was for their good. Their kind affections he has tried, no love is lost on either side. He came to court with fortune clear, which now he runs out every year. Must, at the rate that he goes on, inevitably be undone. Oh, if his master would please, to give him but a writ of ease.' would grant him license to retire, as it hath long been his desire. By fair accounts it would be found, he's poor by ten thousand pound. He owns and hopes it is no sin. He near was partial to his kin. He thought it base for men in stations to crowd the court with their relations. His country was his dearest mother, and every virtuous man his brother through modesty or awkward shame for which he owns himself to blame he found the wisest men he could without respect to friends or blood nor never acts on private views when he hath liberty to choose the sharper swore he hated play except to pass an hour away and well he might for to his cost by want of skill he always lost he heard there was a club of cheats, who had contrived a thousand feats, could change the stock, or cog a die, and thus deceive the sharpest eye. No wonder how his fortune sunk, his brothers fleece him when he's drunk. I own the moral not exact, besides the tale is false in fact, and so absurd that, could I raise up, from fields a lison fabling Aesop. I would accuse him to his face, for libeling the four-foot race, creatures of every kind but ours, well comprehend their natural powers, while we, whom reason ought to sway, mistake talents every day. The ass was never known so stupid to act the part of Trey or Cupid, nor leans upon his master's lap, there to be stroked and fed up with pap as aesop would the world persuade he better understands his trade nor comes when e'er his lady whistles but carries loads and feeds on thistles 
Our author's meaning, I presume, is a creature bipes et implumis, wherein the moralist designed a compliment on humankind, for here he owns that now and then beasts may degenerate into men. End of section 19. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 20 of the Battle of the Books. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift. Section 20. An argument to prove that the abolishing of Christianity in England may, as things now stand, be attended with some inconveniences, and perhaps not produce those many good effects proposed thereby. Written in the year 1708. I am very sensible what a weakness and presumption it is to reason against the general humor and disposition of the world. I remember it was with great justice, and a due regard to the freedom, both of the public and the press, forbidden upon several penalties to write, or discourse, or lay wagers against the blank, even before it was confirmed by Parliament, because that was looked upon as a design to oppose the current of the people, which, besides the folly of it, is a manifest breach of the fundamental law that makes this majority of opinions the voice of God. In like manner, and for the very same reasons, it may perhaps be neither safe nor prudent to argue against the abolishing of Christianity, at a juncture when all parties seem so unanimously determined upon the point, as we cannot but allow from their actions, their discourses, and their writings. However, I know not how, whether from the affectation of singularity, or the perverseness of human nature, but so it unhappily falls out, that I cannot be entirely of this opinion. Nay, though I were sure an order were issued for my immediate prosecution by the Attorney General, I should still confess that in the present posture of our affairs at home or abroad, I do not yet see the absolute necessity of extirpating the Christian religion from among us. This, perhaps, may appear too great a paradox, even for a wise and paxodoxical age to endure. Therefore, I shall handle it with all tenderness, and with the utmost deference to that great and profound majority, which is of another sentiment. And yet the curious may please to observe how much the genius of a nation is liable to alter in half an age. I have heard it affirmed, for certain, by some very odd people, that the contrary opinion was even in their memories as much in vogue as the other is now, and that a project for the abolishing of Christianity would then have appeared as singular, and been thought as absurd, as it would be at this time to write or discourse in its defense. Therefore, I freely own that all appearances are against me. The system of the gospel, after the fate of other systems, is generally antiquated and exploded, and the mass or body of the common people, among whom it seems to have had its latest credit, are now grown as much ashamed of it as their betters, opinions, like fashions, always descending from those of quality to the middle sort, and thence to the vulgar, where at length they are dropped and vanish. But here I would not be mistaken, and must therefore be so bold as to borrow a distinction from the writers on the other side, when they make a difference betwixt nominal and real Trinitarians. I hope no reader imagines me so weak to stand up in the defense of real Christianity, such as used in primitive times, if we may believe the authors of those ages do have an influence upon men's belief and actions. To offer at the restoring of that would indeed be a wild project. It would be to dig up foundations 
to destroy at one blow all the wit and half the learning of the kingdom to break the entire frame and constitution of things to ruin trade extinguish arts and sciences with the professors of them in short to turn our courts exchanges and shops into deserts and would be as absurd as the proposal of horace where he advises the romans all in body to leave their city and seek a new seat in some remote part of the world by way of a cure for the corruption of their manners therefore i think this caution was in itself altogether unnecessary which i have inserted only to prevent all possibility of cavilling since every candid reader will easily understand my discourse to be intended only in defence of nominal christianity the other having been for some time wholly laid aside by general consent as utterly inconsistent with all our present schemes of wealth and power but why we should therefore cut off the name and title of christians altogether the general opinion and resolution be so violent for it i confess i cannot with submission apprehend the consequence necessary however since the undertakers propose such wonderful advantages to the nation by this project and advance many plausible objections against the system of christianity i shall briefly consider the strength of both fairly allow them their greatest weight and offer such answers as i think most reasonable after which i will beg leave to show what inconveniences may possibly happen by such an innovation in the present posture of our affairs first one great advantage proposed by the abolishing of christianity is that it would very much enlarge and establish liberty of conscience that great bulwark of our nation and of the protestant religion which is still too much limited by priestcraft notwithstanding all the good intentions of the legislature as we have lately found by a severe instance for it is confidentially reported that two young gentlemen of real hopes bright wit and profound judgment who upon a thorough examination of causes and effects and by the mere force of natural abilities without the least tincture of learning having made a discovery that there was no god and generously communicating their thoughts for the good of the public were some time ago by an unparalleled severity and upon i know not what obsolete law broke for blasphemy and as it has been wisely observed if persecution once begins no man alive knows how far it may reach or where it will end in answer to all which with deference to wiser judgments i think this rather shows the necessity of a nominal religion among us great wits love to be free with the highest objects and if they cannot be allowed a god to revile or renounce they will speak evil of dignities abuse the government and reflect upon the ministry which i am sure few will deny to be of much more pernicious consequence according to the saying of tiberius dirvum offensa dis curoi as to the particular fact related i think it is not fair to argue from one instance perhaps another cannot be produced yet to the comfort of all those who may be apprehensive of persecution blasphemy we know is freely spoke a million times in every coffee-house and tavern or wherever else good company meet it must be allowed indeed that to break an english free-born officer only for blasphemy was to speak the gentlest of such an action a very high strain of absolute power little can be said in excuse for the general perhaps he was afraid it might give offence to the alleys among whom for aught we know it may be the custom of the country to believe a god but if he argued as some have done upon a mistaken principle that an officer who is guilty of speaking blasphemy 
may some time or other proceed so far as to raise a mutiny the consequence is by no means to be admitted for surely the commander of an english army is like to be but ill obeyed whose soldiers fear and reverence him as little as they do a deity it is further objected against the gospel system that it obliges men to the belief of things too difficult for free thinkers and such who have shook off the prejudices that usually cling to confined education to which i answer that men should be cautious how they raise objections which reflect upon the wisdom of the nation it is not everybody freely allowed to believe whatever he pleases and to publish his beliefs to the world whenever he thinks fit especially if it serves to strengthen the party which is in the right is not everybody freely allowed to believe whatever he pleases and to publish his belief to the world whenever he thinks fit especially if it serves to strengthen the party which is in the right would any indifferent foreigner who should read the trumpery lately written by asgill tyndall toland coward and forty more imagine the gospel to be our rule of faith and to be confirmed by parliaments does any man either believe or say he believes or desire to have it thought that he says he believes one syllable of the matter and is any man worse received upon that score or does he find his want of nominal faith a disadvantage to him in the pursuit of any civil or military employment what if there be an old dormant statue or two against him are they not now obsolete to a degree that empson and dudley themselves if they were now alive would find it impossible to put them in execution it is likewise urged that there are by computation in this kingdom above ten thousand persons whose revenues added to those of my lords the bishops would suffice to maintain at least two hundred young gentlemen of wit and pleasure and free-thinking enemies to priestcraft narrow principles pedantry and prejudices who might be an ornament to the court and town and then again so great a number of able-bodied divines might be a recruit to our fleet and armies this indeed appears to be a consideration of some weight but then on the other side several things deserve to be considered likewise as first whether it may not be thought necessary that in certain tracts of country like what we call parishes there should be one man at least of abilities to read and write then it seems a wrong computation that the revenues of the church throughout this island would be large enough to maintain two hundred young gentlemen or even half that number after the present refined way of living that is to allow each of them such a rent as in a modern form of speech would make them easy but still there is in this project a greater mischief behind and we ought to beware of the woman's folly who killed the hen that every morning laid her a golden egg for pray what would become of the race of men in the next age if we had nothing to trust to beside the scrofulous consumptive production furnished by our men of wit and pleasure when having squandered away their vigour health and estates they are forced by some disagreeable marriage to piece up their broken fortunes and entail rottenness and politeness on their posterity now here are ten thousand persons reduced by the wise regulations of henry the eighth to the necessity of a low diet and moderate exercise who are the only great restorers of our breed without which the nation would in an age or two become one great hospital 
Another advantage proposed by the abolishing of Christianity is the clear gain of one day in seven, which is now entirely lost, and consequently the kingdom one-seventh less considerable in trade, business, and pleasure, besides the loss of the public of so many stately structures now in the hands of the clergy, which might be converted into playhouses, exchanges, market-houses, common dormitories, and other public edifices. I hope I shall be forgiven a hard word, if I call this a perfect cavil. I readily own there hath been an old custom, time out of mind, for people to assemble in the churches every Sunday, and that shops are still frequently shut, in order as it is conceived, to preserve the memory of that ancient practice, but how can this prove a hindrance to business or pleasure is hard to imagine. What if the men of pleasure are forced, one day in the week, to game at home instead of the chocolate house? Are not the taverns and coffee houses open? Can there be a more convenient season for taking a dose of physic? Is not that the chief day for traders to sum up the accounts of the week and for lawyers to prepare their briefs. But I would fain know how it can be pretended that the churches are misapplied. Where are more appointments and rendezvouses of gallantry? Where more care to appear in the foremost box with greater advantage of dress? Where more meetings for business? Where more bargains driven of all sorts? And where are so many conveniences or incitements to sleep. There is one advantage greater than any of the foregoing, proposed by the abolishing of Christianity, that it will utterly distinguish parties among us, by removing those factious distinctions of high and low church, of Wig and Troy, Presbyterian and Church of England, which are now so many mutual clogs upon public proceedings and are apt to prefer the gratifying themselves or depressing their adversaries before the most important interest of the state. I confess, if it were certain that so great an advantage would redound to the nation by this expedient, I would submit and be silent. But will any man say that if the world, warring, drinking, cheating, lying, stealing, were, by act of Parliament, ejected out of the english tongue and dictionaries we should all awake next morning chaste and temperate honest and just and lovers of truth is this a fair consequence or if the physicians would forbid us to pronounce the words pox gout rheumatism and stone would that expedient serve like so many talesmen to destroy the diseases themselves our party and faction rooted in men's hearts no deeper than phrases borrowed from religion or founded upon no firmer principles and is our language so poor that we cannot find other terms to express them our envy pride avarice and ambition such ill nomenclatures that they cannot furnish appellations for their owners will not haydukes and mamelukes mandarins and patshaws or any other words formed at pleasure serve to distinguish those who are in the ministry from others who would be in it if they could what for instance is easier than to vary the form of speech and instead of the word church make it a question in politics whether the monument be in danger because religion was nearest at hand to furnish a new convenient phrases is our invention so barren we can find no other suppose for argument's sake that the tories favoured margarita the whigs mrs tofts and the trimmers valentini would not margaritians tophians and valentinians be very tolerable marks of distinction the Prasini and Veneti, two most virulent factions in Italy, began, if I remember right, by a distinction of colors and ribbons, 
which we might do with as good a trace about the dignity of the blue and the green and serve as properly to divide the court the parliament and the kingdom between them as any other terms of art whatsoever borrowed from religion and therefore i think there is little force in this objection against christianity or prospect of so great an advantage as is proposed in the abolishing of it it is again objected as a very absurd ridiculous custom that a set of men should be suffered much less employed and hired to ball one day in seven against the lawfulness of those methods most in use towards the pursuit of greatness riches and pleasure which are the constant practice of all men alive on the other six but this objection is i think a little unworthy so refined an age as ours let us argue this matter calmly i appeal to the breast of any polite free-thinker whether in the pursuit of gratifying a predominant passion he hath not always felt a wonderful incitement by reflecting it was a thing forbidden and therefore we see in order to cultivate this test the wisdom of the nation hath taken special care that the ladies should be furnished with prohibited skills and the men with prohibited wine and indeed it were to be wished that some other prohibitions were promoted in order to improve the pleasures of the town which for want of such expedients begin already as i am told to flag and grow languid giving way daily to the cruel inroads from the spleen tis likewise proposed as a great advantage to the public that if we once discard the system of the gospel all religion will of course be banished for ever and consequently along with it those grievous prejudices of education which under the names of conscience honour justice and the like are so apt to disturb the peace of human minds and the notions whereof are so hard to be eradicated by right reason or free thinking sometimes during the whole course of our lives here i first observe how difficult it is to get rid of a phrase which for the world has once grown fond of though the occasion that first produced it be entirely taken away for some years past if a man had but an ill-favoured nose the deep thinkers of the age would some way or other contrive to impute the cause to the prejudice of his education from this fountain were said to be derived all our foolish notions of justice piety love of our country all our opinions of god or the future state heaven hell and the like and these might formerly perhaps have been some pretence for the charge but so effectual care hath been since taken to remove those prejudices by an entire change in the methods of education that with honour i mention it to be our polite innovators the young gentlemen who are now on the scene seem to have not the least tincture left of those infusions or string of those weeds and by consequence the reason for abolishing normal but so effectual care hath been since taken to remove those prejudices by an entire change in the methods of education that with honour i mention it to our polite innovators the young gentlemen who are now on the scene seem to have not the least tincture left of those infusions or a string of those weeds and by consequence the reason for abolishing nominal christianity upon that pretext is wholly ceased for the rest it may perhaps admit a controversy whether the banishing all notions of religion whatsoever would be inconvenient for the vulgar not that i am in the least of opinion with those who hold religion to have been the invention of politicians to keep the lower part of the world in awe by the fear of invisible powers unless mankind were then very different from what it is now for i look upon the mass or body of our people here in england to be as free-thinkers 
that is to say, as staunch unbelievers, as any of the highest rank. But I conceive some scattered notions about a superior power to be of singular use for the common people, as furnishing excellent materials to keep children quiet when they grow peevish, and providing topics of amusement in a tedious winter night. Lastly, it is proposed as a singular advantage that the abolishing of Christianity will very much contribute to the uniting of Protestants, by enlarging the terms of communion, so as to take in all sorts of dissenters, who are now shut out of the pale upon account of a few ceremonies, which all sides confess to the things indifferent. That this alone will effectually answer the great ends of a scheme for a comprehension by opening a large and noble gate at which all bodies may enter whereas the chaffering with dissenters and dodging about this or the other ceremony is but like opening a few wickets and leaving them in a jar by which no more than one can get in at a time and that not without stooping and sidling and squeezing his body to all this i answer that there is one darling inclination of mankind which usually affects to be a retainer to religion though she be neither its parent its godmother nor its friend i mean the spirit of opposition that lived long before christianity and can easily subsist without it let us for instance examine wherein the opposition of sectaries among us consists we shall find Christianity to have no share in it at all. Did the, the gospel anywhere prescribe a starched, squeezed countenance, a stiff formal gait, a singularity of manners and habit, or any affected forms and modes of speech different from the reasonable part of mankind? Yet, if Christianity did not lend its name to stand in the gap, and to employ or divert these humours they must of necessity be spent in contraventions to the laws of the land and disturbance of the public peace there is a portion of enthusiasm assigned to every nation which if it hath not proper objects to work on will burst out and set all into a flame if the quiet of a state can be brought by only flinging men a few ceremonies to devour, it is a purchase no wise man would refuse. Let the mastiffs amuse themselves about a sheep's skin stuffed with hay, providing it will keep them from worrying the flock. The institution of convents abroad seems, in one point, a strain of great wisdom, there being few irregularities in human passions which may not have resource to vent themselves in some of those orders, which are so many retreats from the speculative, the melancholy, the proud, the silent, the politic, and the morose, to spend themselves and evaporate the noxious particles for each of whom we in this land are forced to provide a feral sect of religion to keep them quiet and whenever christianity shall be abolished the legislator might find some of other expedient to employ and entertain them for what importance it how large a gate you open if there will always be left a number who place a pride and a merit in not coming in having thus considered the most important objections against christianity and the chief advantages proposed by the abolishing thereof, I shall now, with equal deference and submission to wiser judgments, as before, proceed to mention a few inconveniences that may happen if the gospel should be repealed, which, perhaps, the projectors may not have sufficiently considered. And first, I am very sensible how much the gentlemen of wit and pleasure are apt to murmur, and be choked, at the sight of so many dagle-tailed persons that happen to fall in their way and offend their eyes 
but at the same time these wise reformers do not consider what an advantage and felicity it is for great wits to be always provided with objections of scorn and contempt in order to exercise and improve their talents and divert their spleen from falling on each other or on themselves especially when all this may be done without the least imaginable danger to their persons and to urge another argument of a parallel nature if christianity were once abolished how could the freethinkers the strong reasoners and the men of profound learning be able to find another subject so calculated in all points whereon to display their abilities what wonderful productions of wit should we be deprived of from those whose genius by continual practice hath been wholly turned upon raillery and invectives against religion and would therefore never be able to shine or distinguish themselves upon any other subject we are daily complaining of the great decline of wit among us and we take away the greatest perhaps the only topic we have left who would ever have suspected asgill for wit or toland for a philosopher if the inexhaustible stock of christianity had not been at hand to prove them with materials what other subject through all art or nature could have produced tyndall for a profound author or furnished him with readers it is the wise choice of the subject that alone adorns and distinguishes the writer for had a hundred such pens as these been employed on the side of religion they would have immediately sunk into silence and oblivion nor do i think it wholly groundless or my fear is altogether imaginary that the abolishing of christianity may perhaps bring the church in danger or at least put the senate to the trouble of another securing vote i desire i may not be mistaken i am far from presuming to affirm or think that the church is in danger at present or as such things stand now but we do not know how soon it may be so when the christian religion is repealed as plausible as this prospect seems there may be a dangerous design lurk under it nothing can be more notorious than that the atheists dicets sakinians anti trinitarians and other subdivisions of freethinkers are persons of little zeal for the present ecclesiastical establishment their declared opinion is for repealing the sacramental test they are very indifferent with regard to ceremonies nor do they hold the just divinum of apostopacy therefore they may be intended as one politic step towards altering the constitution of the church established and setting up presbytery in the stead which i leave to be further considered by those at the helm in the last place i think nothing can be more plain than that by this expedient we shall run into the evil we chiefly pretend to avoid and that the abolishment of the christian religion will be the readiest course we can take to introduce popery and i am the more inclined to this opinion because we know it has been the constant practice of the jesuits to send over emissaries with instructions to personate themselves members of the several prevailing sects among us so it is recorded that they have a sundry times appeared in the guise of presbyterians anabaptists independents and quakers according as any of these were most in credit so since the fashion hath been taken up of exploding religion the popish missionaries have not been wanting to mix with the freethinkers among whom toland with the great oracle of the anti-christians is an irish priest the son of an irish priest and the most learned of an ingenious author of a book called the rights of the christian church was in a proper juncture reconciled to the romish faith whose true son as appears by a hundred passages 
in his treatise, he still continues. Perhaps I could add some others to the member, but the fact is beyond dispute, and the reasoning they proceed by is right. For supposing that Christianity to be extinguished, the people will never he at ease till they found out some other method of worship, which will as infallibly produce superstition as this will end in paupery. And therefore, if notwithstanding all I have said, it still be thought necessary to have a bill brought in for repealing Christianity, I would humbly offer an amendment that instead of the word Christianity may be put religion in general, which I conceive will much better answer all the good ends proposed by the projectors of it. For as long as we leave in being a god and his providence, with all the necessary consequences which curious and inquisitive men will be apt to draw from such promises, we do not strike at the root of the evil, though we should ever so effectually annihilate the present scheme of the gospel. For of what use is freedom of thought if it will not produce freedom of action, which is the sole end? how remote soever in appearance of all objections against christianity and therefore the freethinkers consider it as a sort of edifice wherein all the parts have such a mutual dependence on each other that if you happen to pull one single nail the whole fabric must fall to the ground this was happily expressed by him who had heard of a text brought for proof of the Trinity, which, in an ancient manuscript, was differently read. He thereupon immediately took the hint, and by a sudden deduction of a long rites, most logically concluded, Why, if it be as you say, I nay safely drink on and defy the parson. From which, and many the like instances, easy to be produced. I think nothing can be more manifest than the quarrel is not against any particular points of hard digestion in the Christian system, but against religion in general, which, by laying restraints on human nature, is supposed the great enemy to the freedom of thought and action. Upon the whole, if it shall still be thought for the benefit of church and state that Christianity be abolished, I conceive however it may be convenient to defer the execution to a time of peace and not venture in this conjuncture to disoblige our allies who as it falls out are all christians and many of them by the prejudices of their education so bigoted as to place a sort of pride in the appellation if upon being rejected by them we are to trust to an alliance with the turk we shall find ourselves much deceived, for, as he is too remote, and generally engaged in war with the Persian emperor, so his people would be more scandalized at our infidelity than our Christian neighbors, for they are not only strict observers of religion's worship, but what is worse, believe a god, which is more than is required of us even while we preserve the name of Christians. To conclude whatever some may think of this great advantages to trade by this favorite scheme, I do very much apprehend that in six months' time after the act is passed for the extirpation of the gospel, the bank and East India stock may fall at least one per cent, and since that is fifty times more than ever the wisdom of our age thought fit to venture for the preservation of christianity there is no reason we should be at so great a loss merely for the sake of destroying it end of section twenty read by elijah fisher section twenty one of the battle of the books this librivox recording is in the public domain the Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section 21 Hints Towards an Essay on Conversation I have observed few obvious subjects to have been so seldom 
or at least so slightly handled as this and indeed i know few so difficult to be treated as it ought nor yet upon which there seemeth so much to be said most things pursued by men for the happiness of public or private life are wit or folly have so refined that they seldom subsist but in idea a true friend a good marriage a perfect form of government with some others require so many ingredients so good in their several kinds and so much niceness in mixing them that for some thousands of years men have despaired of reducing their schemes to perfection but in conversation it is or might be otherwise for here we are only to avoid a multitude of errors which although a matter of some difficulty may be in every man's power for want of which it remaineth as mere an idea as the other therefore it seemeth to me that the truest way to understand conversation is to know the faults and errors to which it is subject and from thence every man to form maxims to himself whereby it may be regulated because it requireth few talents to which most men are not born or at least may not acquire without any great genius or study for nature bath left every man a capacity of being agreeable though not of shining in company and there are a hundred men sufficiently qualified for both who by a very few faults that they might correct in half an hour are not so much as tolerable i was prompt to write my thoughts upon this subject by mere indignation to reflect that so useful and innocent a pleasure so fitted for every period and condition of life and so much in all men's power should be so much neglected and abused and in this discourse it will be necessary to note those errors that are obvious as well as others which are seldomer observed since there are few so obvious or acknowledged into which most men some time or other are not apt to run for instance nothing is more generally exploded than the folly of talking too much yet i rarely remember to have seen five people together where some one among them hath not been predominant in that kind to the great constraint and disgust of all the rest but among such as deal in multitudes of words none are comparable to the sober deliberate talker who proceedeth with much thought and caution maketh his preface brancheth out into several digressions findeth a hint that putteth him in the mind of another story which he promiseth to tell you when this is done cometh back regularly to his subject cannot readily call to mind some person's name holdeth his head complaineth of his memory the whole company all this while in suspense at length says he it is no matter and goes on and to crown the business it perhaps proveth at last a story the company hath heard fifty times before or at best some insipid adventure of the relater another general fault in conversation is that of those who affect to talk of themselves some without any ceremony will run over the history of their lives relate the annals of their diseases with the several symptoms and circumstances of them will enumerate the hardships and injustice they have suffered in court in parliament in love or in law others are more dexterous and with great art will lie on the watch to hook in their own praise they will call a witness to remember 
they always foretold what would happen in such a case but none would believe them they advised such a man from the beginning and told him the consequences just as they happened but he would have his own way others make a vanity of telling their faults they are the strangest men in the world they cannot dissemble they own it is a folly they have lost abundance of advantages by it but if you would give them the world they cannot help it there is something in their nature that abhors insincerity and constraint with many other unsufferable topics of the same altitude of such mighty importance every man is to himself and ready to think he is so to others without once making this easy and obvious reflection that his affairs can have no more weight with other men than theirs have with him and how little that is he is sensible enough where company hath met i often have observed two persons discover by some accident that they were bred together at the same school or university after which the rest are condemned to silence and to listen while these two are refreshing each other's memory with the arc tricks and passages of themselves and their comrades i know a great officer of the army who will sit for some time with a superlicious and impatient silence full of anger and contempt for those who are talking at length of a sudden demand audience decide the matter in a short dogmatical way then withdraw within himself again and vouchsafe to talk no more until his spirits circulate again to the same point there are some faults in conversation which none are so subject to as the men of wit nor ever so much as when they are with each other if they have opened their mouths without endeavouring to say a witty thing they think it is so many words lost it is a torment to the hearers as much as to themselves to see them upon the rack for invention and in perpetual constraint with so little success they must do something extraordinary in order to acquit themselves and answer their character else the standers by may be disappointed and be apt to think them only like the rest of mortals i have known two men of wit industriously brought together in order to entertain the company where they have made a very ridiculous figure and provided all mirth at their own expense i know a man of wit who is never easy but where he can be allowed to dictate and preside he neither expecteth to be informed or entertained but to display his own talents his business is to be good company and not good conversation and therefore he chooseth to frequent those who are content to listen and profess themselves his admirers and indeed the worst conversation i ever remember to have heard in my life was that at will's coffee-house where the wits as they were called used formally to assemble that is to say five or six men who had written plays or at least prologues or had share in a miscellany came thither and entertained one another with their trifling composures in so important an air as if they had been the noblest efforts of human nature or that the fate of kingdoms depended upon them and they were usually attended with a humble audience of young students from the inns of courts or the universities who at due distance listened to these oracles and returned home with great contempt for their law and philosophy their heads filled with trash under the name of politeness criticism and billis letters by these means the poets for many years past were all overrun with pedantry 
for, as I take it, the word is not properly used, because pedantry is the too front or unreasonable obtruding our own knowledge in common discourse and placing too great a value upon it by which definition men of the court or the army may be as guilty of pedantry as a philosopher or a divine and it is the same vice in women when they are over copious upon the subject of their petticoats or their fans or their china for which reason although it be a nice piece of prudence as well as good manners to put men upon talking on subjects they are best versed in yet that is a liberty a wise man could hardly take because beside the imputation of pedantry it is what he would never improve by this great town is usually provided with some player mimic or buffoon who hath a general reception at the good tables familiar and domestic with persons of the first quality and usually sent for at every meeting to divert the company against which i have no objection you go there as to a farce or a puppet show your business is only to laugh and season either out of inclination or civility while this merry companion is acting his part it is a business he hath undertaken and we are to suppose he is paid for his day's work i only quarrel when in select and private meetings where men of wit and learning are invited to pass on evening this jester should be admitted to run over his circle of tricks and make the whole company unfit for any other conversation besides the indignity of confounding men's talents at so shameful a rate raillery is the finest part of conversation but as it is our usual custom to counterfeit and adulterate whatever is too dear for us so we have done with this and turned it all into what is generally called repartee or being smart just as when an expensive fashion cometh up those who are not able to reach it content themselves with some paltry imitation it now passeth for raillery to run a man down in discourse to put him out of countenance and make him ridiculous sometimes to expose the defects of his person or understanding on all which occasions he is obliged not to be angry to avoid the imputation of not being able to take a jest it is admirable to observe one who is dexterous at this art singling out a weak adversary getting the laugh on his side and then carrying all before him the french with whom we borrow the word have a quite different idea of the thing and so we in the politer age of our fathers raillery was to say something that at first appeared a reproach or a reflection but by some turn of wit unexpected and surprising ended always in a compliment and to the advantage of the person it was addressed to and surely one of the best rules in conversation is never to say a thing which any of the company can reasonably wish we had rather left unsaid nor can there anything be well more contrary to the ends for which people meet together than to part unsatisfied with each other or themselves there are two faults in conversation which appear very different yet arise from the same root and are equally blamable i mean an impatience to interrupt others and the uneasiness of being interrupted ourselves the two chief ends of conversation are to entertain and improve those we are among or to receive those benefits ourselves which whoever will consider cannot easily run into either of those two errors because 
when any man speaketh in company it is to be supposed he doth it for his hearer's sake and not his own so that common direction will teach us not to force their attention if they are not willing to lend it nor on the other side to interrupt him who is in possession because that is the grossest matter to give the preference to our own good sense there are some people whose good manners will not suffer them to interrupt you but what is almost as bad will discover abundance of impatience and lie upon the watch until you have done because they have started something in their own thoughts which they long to be delivered of meantime they are so far from regarding what passes that their imaginations are wholly turned upon what they have in reserve for fear it should slip out of their memory and thus they can find their invention which might otherwise range over a hundred things full as good and that might be much more naturally introduced there is a sort of rude familiarity which some people by practising among their intimates have introduced into their general conversation and would have it pass for innocent freedom or humour which is a dangerous experiment in our northern climate where all the little decorum and politeness we have are purely forced by art and are so ready to lapse into barbarity this among the romans was the raillery of slaves and with which we have many instances in platus it seemeth to have been introduced among us by cromwell who by preferring the scum of the people made it a court entertainment of which i have heard many particulars and considering all things were turned upside down it was reasonable and judicious although it was a piece of policy found out to ridicule a point of honour in the other extreme when the smallest word misplaced among gentlemen ended in a duel there are some men excellent at telling a story and provided with the plentiful stock of them which they can draw out upon occasion all companies and considering how long conversation runs among us now it is not altogether a contemptible talent however it is subject to two unavoidable defects frequent repetition and being soon exhausted so that whoever valueth this gift in himself hath need of a good memory and ought frequently to shift his company that he may not discover the weakness of his fund for those who are thus endowed have seldom any other revenue but live upon the main stock great speakers in public are seldom agreeable in private conversation whether the faculty be natural or acquired by practice and often venturing natural elocution although it may seem a paradox usually springeth from a barrenness of invention and of words by which men who have only one stock of notions upon every subject and one set of phrases to express them in they swim upon the superfices and offer themselves on every occasion therefore men of much learning and who know the compass of a language are generally the worst talkers on a sudden until much practice hath injured and emboldened them because they are confounded with plenty of matter variety of notions and of words which they cannot readily choose but are perplexed and entangled by too great a choice which is no disadvantage in private conversation where on the other side the talent of haranguing is of all others most insupportable nothing hath spoiled men more for conversation than the character of being wits to support which they never fail of encouraging a number of followers and admirers who list themselves in their service wherein they find their accounts on both sides by pleasing their mutual vanity this hath given the former such an air of superiority 
and made the latter so pragmatical that neither of them are well to be endured i say nothing here of the itch of dispute and contradiction telling of lies or of those who are troubled with the disease called the wandering of the thoughts that they are never present in mind at what passeth in discourse for whoever labours under any of these possessions is as unfit for conversation as madmen in badlam i think i have gone over most of the errors in conversation that have fallen under my notice or memory except some that are merely personal and others too gross to need exploding such as lewd or profane talk but i pretend only to treat the ears of conversation in general and not the several subjects of discourse which would be infinite thus we see how human nature is most debased by the abuse of that faculty which is held the great distinction between men and brutes and how little advantage we make of that which might be the greatest the most lasting and the most innocent as well as useful pleasure of life in default of which we are forced to take up with those poor amusements of dress and visiting or the more pernicious ones of play drink and vicious armours whereby the nobility of gentry of both sexes are entirely corrupted both in body and mind and have lost all notions of love honour friendship and generosity which under the name of fopperies have been for some time laughed out of doors this degeneracy of conversation with the pernicious consequences thereof upon our humours and dispositions hath been owing among their other causes to the custom arisen for some time past of excluding women from any share in our society further than in parties at play or dancing or in the pursuit of an armour i take the highest period of politeness in england and it is of the same date to france to have been the peaceable part of king charles the first's reign and from what we read of those times as well as from the accounts i have formerly met with some who lived in that court the methods then used for raising and cultivating conversation were altogether different from ours several ladies whom we find celebrated by the poets of that age had assemblies at their houses where persons of the best understanding and of both sexes met to pass the evenings in discoursing upon whatever agreeable subjects were occasionally started and although we are apt to ridicule the sublime platonic notions they had or personated in love and friendship i conceive their refinements were grounded upon reason and that a little grain of the romance is no ill ingredient to preserve and exalt the dignity of human nature without which it is apt to degenerate into everything that is sordid vicious and low if there were no other use in the conversation of ladies it is sufficient that they would lay a restraint upon those odious topics of immodesty and indecencies into which the rudeness of our northern genius is so apt to fall and therefore it is observable in those sprightly gentlemen about the town who are so very dexterous and at entertaining a visard mask in the park or the playhouse that in the company of ladies of virtue and honour they are silent and disconcerted and out of their element there are some people who think they sufficiently acquit themselves and entertain their company with relating the facts of no consequence nor at all out of the road of such common incidents as happen every day and this i have observed more frequently among the scots than any other nation who are very careful not to omit the minutest circumstances of time or place which kind of discourse if it were not a little relived by the 
uncouth terms and phrases as well as accent and gesture peculiar to that country would be hardly tolerable it is not a fault in company to talk much but to continue it long is certainly one for the, the majority of those who are got together be naturally silent or cautious the conversation will flag unless it be often renewed by one among them who can start new subjects provided he doth not dwell upon them but leaveth room for answers and replies end of section twenty one read by elijah fisher section twenty two of the battle of the books this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift Section 22 Thoughts on Various Subjects We have just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. Reflect on things past as wars, negotiations, factions, etc. We enter so little into those interests that we wonder how men could possibly be so busy and concerned for things so transitory look on the present times we find the same humour yet wonder not at all a wise man endeavours by considering all circumstances to make conjectures and form conclusions but the smallest accident intervening and in the course of affairs it is impossible to foresee all does often produce such turns and changes that at last he is just as much in doubt of events as the most ignorant and inexperienced person. Positiveness is a good quality for preachers and orators, because he that would obtrude his thoughts and reasons upon a multitude will convince others the more, as he appears convinced himself. How is it possible to expect that mankind will take advice, when they will not so much as take warning. I forget whether advice will be among the lost things which Aristo says are to be found in the moon, that and time ought to have been there. No preacher is listened to but time, which gives us the same train and turn of thought that older people have tried in vain to put into our heads before. When we would desire or solicit anything, our minds run wholly on the good side or circumstances of it. When it is obtained, our minds run wholly on the bad ones. In a glass house, the workmen often fling in a small quantity of fresh coals, which seems to disturb the fire, but very much enlivens it. This seems to allude to a gentle stirring of the passions, that the mind may not languish religion seems to have grown an infant with age and requires miracles to nurse it as it had in its infancy all fits of pleasure are balanced by an equal degree of pain and languor it is like spending this year part of the next year's revenue the latter part of a wise man's life is taken up in curing the follies prejudices and false opinions he had contracted in the former. Would a writer know how to behave himself with relation to posterity? Let him consider in old books what he finds that he is glad to know, and what omissions he most laments. Whatever the poets pretend, it is plain they give immortality to none but themselves. It is Homer and Virgil we reverence and admire not achilles or aeneas with historians it is quite the contrary our thoughts are taken up with the actions persons and events we read and we little regard the authors when a true genius appears in the world you may know him by this sign that the dunces are all in confederacy against him men who possess all the advantages of life are in a state where there are many accidents to disorder and discompose, but few to please them. It is unwise to punish cowards with ignominy, for if they had regarded that they would not have been cowards, 
death is their proper punishment because the fee fear it most the greatest inventors were produced in the times of ignorance as the use of the compass gunpowder and printing and by the dullest nation as the germans one argument to prove that the common relations of ghosts and spectres are generally false may be drawn from the opinion held that spirits are never seen by more than one person at a time that is to say it is seldom happens to above one person in a company to be possessed with any high degree of spleen or melancholy i am apt to think that in the day of judgment there will be small allowance given to the wise for their want of morals nor to the ignorant for their want of faith because both are without excuse this renders the advantages equal of ignorance and knowledge but some scruples in the wise and some vices in the ignorant will perhaps be forgiven upon the strength of templation to each the value of several circumstances in story lessens very much by distance of time though some minute circumstances are very valuable and it requires great judgment in a writer to distinguish it has grown a word of course for writers to say this critical age as divines say this sinful age it is pleasant to observe how free the present age is in laying taxes on the next future ages shall talk of this this shall be famous to all posterity whereas their time and thoughts will be taken up about present things as ours are now the chameleon who is said to feed upon nothing but air hath of all animals the nimblest tongue when a man is made a spiritual peer he loses his surname when a temporal his christian name it is in disputes as in armies where the weaker side sets up false lights and makes a great noise to make the enemy he believe more numerous and strong than they really are some men under the notions of weeding out prejudices eradicate virtue honesty and religion in all well instituted commonwealths care has been taken to limit men's possessions which is done for many reasons and among the rest for one which perhaps is not often considered that when bounds are set to men's desires after they have acquired as much as the laws will permit them their private interest is at an end and they have nothing to do but to take care of the public there are but three ways for a man to revenge himself of the censure of the world to despise it to return the like or to endeavour to live so as to avoid it the first of these is usually pretended the last is almost impossible the universal practice is for the second i never heard a finer piece of satire against lawyers than that of astrologers when they pretend by rulers of art to tell when a suit will end and whether to the advantage of the plaintiff or defendant thus making the matter depended entirely upon the influence of the stars without the least regard to the merits of the cause the expression in apocrypha about tobit and his dog following him i have often heard ridiculed yet homer has the same words of telemachus more than once and virgil says something like it of invader and i take the book of tobit to be partially poetical i have known some men possessed of good qualities which were very serviceable to others but useful to themselves like a sundial on the front of a house to inform the neighbors and passengers but not the owner within if a man would register all his opinions upon love politics religion learning etc beginning from his youth and so go on to old age what a bundle of inconsistencies and contradictions would appear at last what do they do in heaven we are ignorant of what they do we are told expressly that they neither marry 
nor are given in marriage it is a miserable thing to live in suspense it is the life of a spider the stoical scheme of supplying our wants by looping off our desires is like cutting off our feet when we want shoes physics ought not to give their judgment of religion for the same reason that butchers are not admitted to be jurors upon life and death the reason why so few marriages are happy is because young ladies spend their time in making nets not in making cages if a man will observe as he walks the streets, I believe he will find the merriest countenances in mourning coaches. Nothing more unqualifies a man to act with prudence than a misfortune that is attended with shame and guilt. The power of fortune is confessed only by the miserable, for the happy impute all their success to prudence or merit. Ambition often puts men upon doing the meanest offices so climbing is performed in the same posture with creeping censure is the tax a man pays to the public for being eminent although men are accused for not knowing their own weakness yet perhaps as few know their own strength it is in men as in souls where sometimes there is a vein of gold which the owner knows not of satire is reckoned the easiest of all wit but i take it to be otherwise in very bad times for it is as hard to satirize well a man of distinguished vices so as to praise well a man of distinguished virtues it is easy enough to do either to people of moderate characters invention is the talent of youth and judgment of age so that our judgment grows harder to please when we have fewer things to offer it this goes through the whole commerce of life when we are told our friends find it difficult to please us and are less concerned whether we be pleased or no no wise man ever wished to be younger an idle reason lessens the weight of the good ones you gave before the motives of the best actions will not bear too strict an inquiry it is allowed that the cause of most actions good or bad may he resolve into the love of ourselves but the self-love of some man inclines them to please others and the self-love of others is wholly employed in pleasing themselves this makes the great distinction between virtue and vice religion is the best motive of all actions yet religion is allowed to be the highest instance of self-love old men view best at a distance with the eyes of their understanding as well as with those of nature some people take more care to hide their wisdom than their folly anthony henley's farmer dying of an asthma said well if i can get this breath once out i'll take care it never got in again the humour of exploding many things under the name of trifles fopperies and only imaginary goods is a very false proof either of wisdom or magnanimity and a great check to virtuous actions for instance with regard to fame there is in most people a reluctance and unwillingness to be forgotten we observe even among the vulgar how found they are to have an inscription over their grave it requires little but philosophy to discover and observe there is no intrinsic values in all this however if it be founded in our nature as an incitement to virtue it ought not to be ridiculed complaint is the largest tribute heaven receives and the sincerest part of our devotion the common fluency of speech in many men and most women is owing to a scarcity of matter and a scarcity of words for whoever is a master of language and hath a full mind of ideas will be apt in speaking to hesitate upon the choice of both whereas common speakers have only one set of ideas and one set of words to clothe them in and these are always ready at the mouth 
so people come faster out of a church when it is almost empty than when a crowd is at the door few are qualified to shine in company but it is in most men's power to be agreeable the reason therefore why conversation runs so low at present is not the defect of understanding but pride vanity ill-nature affectation singularity positiveness or some other vice the effect of a wrong education to be vain is rather a mark of humility than pride vain men delight in telling what honours have been done them with great company they have kept and the like by which they plainly confess that these honours were more than their due and such as their friends would not believe if they had not been told whereas a man truly proud thinks the greatest honours below his merit and consequently scorns to boast i therefore deliver it as a maxim that whoever desires the character of a proud man ought to conceal his vanity law in a free country is or ought to be the determination of the majority of those who have property in land one argument used to the disadvantage of providence i take to be a very strong one in its defence it is objected that storms and tempests unfruitful seasons serpents spiders flies and other noxious or troublesome animals with many more instances of the like kind discover an imperfection in nature because the human life would be much easier without them but the design of providence may clearly be perceived in this proceeding the motions of the sun and moon in short the whole system of the universe as far as philosophers have been able to discover and observe are in the utmost degree in regulatory and perfection but wherever god hath left to man the power of interposing a remedy by thought or labour there he hath placed things in a state of imperfection on purpose to stir up human industry without which life would stagnate or indeed rather could not subsist at all curis acunt mortalia corda praise is the daughter of present power how inconsistent is man with himself i have known several persons of great fame for wisdom in public affairs and councils governed by foolish servants i have known great ministers distinguished for wit and learning who preferred none but to dunces i have known men of great valour cowards to their wives i have known men of the greatest cunning perpetually cheated i knew three great ministers who could exactly compute and settle the accounts of a kingdom but were wholly ignorant of their own economy the preaching of divines helps to preserve well-inclined men in the course of virtue but seldom or never reclaims the vicious princes usually make wiser choices than the servants whom they trust for the disposal of places i have known a prince more than once choose an able minister but i never observed that minister to use his credit in the disposal of an employment to a person whom he thought the fittest for it one of the greatest in this age owned and excused the matter from the violence of parties and the unreasonableness of friends small causes are sufficient to make a man uneasy when great ones are not in the way for want of block he will stumble at a straw dignity high station or great riches are in some sort necessary to old men in order to keep the younger at a distance who are otherwise too apt to insult them upon the score of their age every man desires to live long but no man would be old love of flattery in most men proceeds from the mean opinion they have of themselves and women from the contrary if books and laws continue to increase as they have done for fifty years past i am in some concern for future ages how any man will be learned or any man a lawyer kings are commonly said to have long hands i wish they had as long ears princes in their infancy childhood and youth are said to discover prejudiced parts and wit to speak things that will surprise and astonish 
strange so many hopeful princes and so many shameful kings if they happened to die young they would have been prodigies of wisdom and virtue if they live they are often prodigies indeed but of another sort politics as the word is commonly understood have nothing but corruptions and consequently of no use to a good king or a good ministry for which reason courts are so overrun with politics a nice man is a man of nasty ideas apollo was held the god of physic and sender of diseases both were originally the same trade and still continue old men and comets have been reverenced for the same reason their long beards and pretenses to foretell events a person who asked at court what he thought of an ambassador and his train who were all embroidery and lace full of bows cringes and gestures he said it was solomon's importation gold and apes most sorts of diversion in men children and other animals as an imitation of fighting augustus meeting an ass with lucky name foretold himself good fortune i meet many asses but none of them have lucky names if a man makes me keep my distance the comfort is he keeps his at the same time who can deny that all men are violent lovers of truth when we see them so positive in their errors which they will maintain out of their zeal to truth although they contradict themselves every day of their lives that was excellently observed say i when i read a passage in an author where his opinion agrees with mine when we differ then i pronounce him to be mistaken very few men properly speaking live present but are providing to live another time laws penned with the utmost care and exactness and in the vulgar language are often perverted to wrong meanings then why should we wonder that the bible is so although men are accused for not knowing their weakness yet perhaps as few know their own strength a man seeing a wasp creeping into a vial filled with honey that was hung on a fruit tree said thus why thou sottish animal art thou mad to go into that vial where you see many hundred of your kind that are dying in it before you the reproach is just answered the wasp but not from you men who are so far from taking example by other people's follies that you will not take warning by your own if after falling several times into this vial and escaping by chance i should fall in again i should then but resemble you an old mister kept a tame jackdaw that used to steal pieces of money and hide them in a hole when the cat observing asked why he would hoard up those round shining things that he could make no use of why said the jackdaw my master has a whole chestful and makes no more use of them than i men are content to be laughed at for their wit but not for their folly if the men of wit and genius would resolve never to complain in their works of critics and detectors the next age would not know that they ever had any after all the maxims and systems of trade and commerce a standard-by would think the affairs of the world were most ridiculously contrived there are a few countries which if well cultivated would not support double the number of their inhabitants and yet fewer where one-third of the people are not extremely stinted even in the necessaries of life i send out twenty barrels of corn which would maintain a family in bread for a year and i bring back in return a vessel of wine which half a dozen good follows would drink in less than a month at the expense of their health and reason a man would have but few spectators if he offered to show for three pence how he could thrust a red-hot iron into a barrel of gunpowder and how it should not take fire End of section 22 Read by Elijah Fisher
End of The Battle of the Books and Other Short Pieces by Jonathan Swift